Downtown Charlotte hosting the ACC Championship yet again. We know one team that will be playing as we just saw Duke punch its ticket. But who will they face? We will find off shortly as Georgia Tech and NC State getting ready to go head to head. The Wolfpack, the top hitting team in the ACC. First pitch set for 5 o'clock as we welcome you into the ACC Network Studios alongside Dallin Cuff. I'm Kelsey Riggs, and Dallin, that was a fun game to watch for Duke. Uh, yeah, from the first from the first at bat, Joey Loperfito goes yard. It was uh, exciting, and Duke has won 11 straight. Uh, hold tight. We're, we're, we'll be back here. We've got a full hour almost. We're getting you to 5 o'clock. The other uh, ACC semifinal in the championship, NC State taking on Georgia Tech. Exactly 48 minutes and 40 seconds until that second semifinal gets going down at Truist Field in Charlotte. Kelsey drops a tear looking at that town. She misses it partly. I do. We'll be right back. <laughs> Nine, two, three. Back to baseball, and we are less than a half hour away from first pitch in the second semifinals game of the day. NC State, Terrell Tatum. What will he be able to do against Georgia Tech? 11 home runs this year. All ACC first team. Back to baseball we go. 17 minutes away from the two seed Georgia Tech taking on the three seed in the ACC Championship semifinal. Duke awaits the winner. Luke Waddell trying to get his club back to where they were in 2019, which was the championship game where they fell. Last time the Jackets have won it all was in 2014. Let's get down to Roddy Jones, who's in Charlotte with coach Danny Hall. Thanks, guys. Here with head coach Danny Hall ahead of their game against the NC State Wolfpack for the Georgia Tech Yellow Jackets. And coach, it seems like every game has been extra innings, walk off. How's your blood pressure been the last couple of weeks? I uh, haven't been to the doctor, but I can tell you the blood pressure has been a little high. Uh, I think someone pointed out that we've had three uh, extra inning games in like our last five games or something like that. So uh, we've had some close games. Uh, and so, yeah, tension has run high. But, you know, I, uh, I'd rather come out on the winning side of those than the losing side. So it just makes it you know, a lot easier, but just proud of our team. You know, we got a great chance here today to uh, play in the semifinals against a great team, and uh, I'm sure it'll be a good ball game. Absolutely. Uh, with the game being here at Truist Field and the way the ball's been flying out of the ballpark, how does that change what your pitchers do on the mound? I don't think it changes. I just think at the end of the day, you have to keep the baseball down. If you get the ball elevated in the strike zone and someone hits it in the air, it's got a chance to go out of here. and. We've seen that for us and we've seen it against us, but I think the key for us is Marquise Grissom just keeping the ball down, throwing all his pitches for strikes. Need to play good defense. You don't want to give somebody extra outs, but uh, I like the ballpark. Uh, you know, it's very offensive friendly, uh, but I just think the city of Charlotte's done a great job and it's a beautiful ballpark. Well, you mentioned Marquise Grissom, the true freshman starting for you today. Did you have any words with him before his first start in the ACC tournament? No, I won't. I don't worry about him. You know, he uh, comes from good genes with his yeah. dad. He's been seen a lot of baseball games, been a lot of, around a lot of great players. And, you know, he doesn't get rattled. So it's just a it's a great challenge for him. But uh, I look forward to watching him compete. Yeah. Well, thanks, coach. Thank you. All right, guys, back to you in studio. Roddy, appreciate that. We are mere minutes away, 15 minutes away from first pitch between Georgia Tech and NC State. What can we expect from the Yellow Jackets? Well, Roddy Jones, not just interviewing coaches, also coming on with us as an analyst. And we also have Danny Graves back with us now. Uh, Roddy, I got to start with the fact that you're down in Charlotte getting to actually be at a game. I know you're a little probably conflicted because you're a huge lacrosse fan as well. So you're streaming those games right now. But what's it been like? We hear everybody talking about the atmosphere and the opportunity to play down there. Well, Kelsey, it's been incredible. This is the first baseball game that I've been to since the pandemic hit. So just walking in the stadium, seeing the diamond, seeing how green the grass was, seeing players, hearing the pop of the mid, it's, it's been awesome. And the fans have really enjoyed it as well. You can just tell everybody is excited about getting to some sense of normalcy. And Charlotte's been an excellent host. The backdrop you absolutely can't beat. And the baseball's been pretty darn good too. Vivid imagery, Roddy, Roddy Jones right there. Well done. Appreciate that for those that are 1,200 miles away. Uh, uh, Danny, let's talk about this Georgia Tech team. Roddy, we know you, you know them quite well as well. Uh, when you look at this team, they've played, and they've won a lot of very tight games. What does that say to you about this club? 
Well, to me, that means that they don't ever give up, and, and they know that they're still good when it gets, comes down to it in late innings or extra innings. And you, you listen to what Coach Hall was saying. Uh, yes, of course, you want to be on the winning side of that, but it's something that they're used to. And, and you know, hopefully uh, they don't have to worry about that today with Marquise Grissom throwing and the bloodlines that he has. This game is not too big for him. So I, I think if he can – uh, command the strike zone, he can get deep into the game, and then hopefully that Georgia Tech offense can take over like they have been late in the games. Roddy, close games also sometimes mean walk-off wins, which means excitement and momentum. Georgia Tech has three walk-off wins in their last 10 games. What have you heard from this team, just kind of about the momentum that they try to take from those type of wins? Well, first off, Dallin, the one piece of the imagery that I did not paint is that it's hot. So if I start sweating, <laughs> you'll have to excuse me. Uh, but Kelsey, to what you said, this team is confident. Um, they know that when they get deep in ball games, not only do they have the arms to be able to keep them in games in the bullpen, but they also have the confidence at the plate, especially in a ballpark like this where home runs are flying out uh, like candy, that they are in every single game. They have a lot of poise. This is a team that was very young to start the season. They played a lot of baseball, obviously, as everybody has. So they've grown up and they're playing really confidently as most of the teams are at this point who are projected to go to regionals. Roddy, thanks a lot. Danny as well. Hold tight. We'll be back to you. Maybe Roddy find some shade. Uh, Danny's all good <laughs> in his house. We'll be back to you guys after the break as we're getting you set for this NC State Georgia Tech game. Kevin Parada, the catcher for the Jackets, top 10 in the ACC and hits. He leads his club in batting average. He's going to have to show up and show out for them to beat this Wolfpack crew. We'll be back talking Wolfpack after this. Welcome back into All ACC. Duke has already made its way into the finals. They'll play the winner of NC State and Georgia Tech. And we talked about how Duke has been on a hot streak. Well, take a look at NC State. They started this season 4-9, and nine, including going 1-8 and eight in ACC play during that stretch. Since then, the pack has gone 25 and 7, including winning eight out of their last 10 games. Roddy Jones back on site with their head coach, Elliot Avon. Here with Coach Elliot Avon, head coach of the NC State Wolfpack, about to take on Georgia Tech. And Coach, Georgia Tech was your first ACC series all the way back in February. A lot's changed since then. Your team's been on a heck of a run. What have you improved the most since that first series? Well, I just think we got, you know, the season started so quick for everybody. We started ACC two weeks earlier. We missed a week, um, the opening weekend of the games. We missed that. We got covid it out. And, uh, Ever since then, it's just been a blur, but it seems like forever since we've seen Georgia Tech. Yeah, absolutely, and they've been playing well as well, but you guys had to wait a while to play your first game in this tournament, had to wait until Thursday night. What was that like that had your team so ready to play on Thursday night? Oh, I think we've been ready to play for a couple months now. I think they, they're a team that can adjust to most things good. That's a good thing because, we, like you said, we had to wait till Thursday night, but mostly we've been waiting in the locker room because we've had the – you know, eight o'clock game twice, and it seems like it turned into nine o'clock game. And yeah. so they just hang out in the locker room, but they had, you, you couldn't stand in there. It's the loudest noise I've ever heard with music. They got cards going everywhere, games I haven't seen, and they make the most of it. So uh, it's been a good group to, uh, to have these things happen. Love it. Well, you've got a freshman, a second year freshman in Sam Heifel on the mound, making his first start in the ACC tournament. Ball's been flying out of this ballpark. <laughs> What will you tell him before he takes them out? Well, you know, Sam, I won't tell him anything. Sam's been doing it all year. He's been absolutely unbelievable. He, Reed Johnston, Evan Justice, Matt Willison have gotten us to this point uh, through a depleted bullpen. And uh, so you don't say anything, but this is, like you said, a really good Georgia Tech team and the ball is flying out of this ballpark. Well, it's two of the best hitting teams in the conference. It should be a great one. Coach, good luck. Roddy, thank you. I appreciate it. Dallin, Kelsey, back to you guys. Roddy, thanks. That full screen definitely shows what you just said. Two of the best hitting teams in the conference. NC State leads the ACC in batting average and slugging percentage this season, while also ranking second in fielding percentage. On the other side, Georgia Tech paces the conference in RBIs and runs scored as well as doubles. Let's bring back in Roddy Jones and Danny Graves now. And Danny, is it going to be an offensive slugfest in this game or what should we expect? You know, that, that's the first thing I thought of when you're going over all those stats for both teams, that this could be like a 14 to 12 game. And I'm, no, I'm not going to pick who's going to win. But I just know <laughs> that there's going to be a ton of offense. 
<laughs> Maybe Roddy can pick the winner, <laughs> but I'm just saying there's going to be offense like crazy with both these teams. We don't need Roddy to pick. We think we know where he's going. Yellow Jacket, no, I'm not going to even ask you that question. Uh, but, Roddy, you just heard Coach down there talking about the vibe in the clubhouse. How important do you think that is for this team as they turn their season around? How indicative of, is it, of it is that group that acts like that in the tournament right now, that loose? Well, as you said, it's a loose ball club. And I think, again, we, we kind of talked about it with Georgia Tech. They're playing incredibly confidently. This was a team that was a lot was expected of them coming into the season. They scuffled to start and then really got going. And I think as they found their stride, they found their confidence. Even though they've been hit with some injuries, particularly in the bullpen, they've been able to overcome it, particularly at the plate. They know they can hit anybody. And in a ballpark like this, they are extremely dangerous, as is Georgia Tech. But uh, I think NC State knows that they're going to be able to put up some runs against just about anybody we have seen plenty of home runs already we've seen a lot from both of these teams this year but Danny we were just taking a look there at Sam Highfill and we heard coach say you don't have to say a lot to him in a moment like this what do you expect to see from Sam well you know as long as he keeps the ball down I know it said it's going to be 14 to 12 hopefully it's not because I like pitchers duels but <laughs> if he keeps the ball down in the strike zone and keeps it in the park then he's going to give himself a chance and, and, and this NC State team a chance but you know, Roddy's there. He's seen it all. He's seen these balls jump out of there like crazy. And thankfully, I'm not pitching anymore because I don't want to see it. But as a pitcher, you have to go in there thinking, keep the ball down, don't make any mistakes up in the strike zone, and you should be okay. It should be okay. But we'll, we'll see if that actually pans out. Let's talk should about the be. other pitcher, Marquise Grissom Jr. <laughs> I remember I mean, growing up, I loved his pops. Dude, I mean, the guy was nice, loved his gear, yeah. the whole thing. Uh, Roddy, in terms of his pitching game, who do you actually think has the advantage in this pitching duel with two very good offenses? Well, I'm going to give it to Sam Highfill. He's a second-year freshman, and the biggest thing is he's kept his walks down this year, only 18 walks on the season. Marquise Grissom Jr. on the other side didn't play for much of the start of the season, had a back injury, really just got going in mid-April. So he's still kind of working out the kinks as a true freshman. So I'm going to give it to Sam Highfill, and he's been able to stretch out his outings. And if you can get to the back of that bullpen, particularly with Evan Justice, if NC State can do that with the lead, it's going to be really tough for Georgia Tech to overcome it. Danny, we talked about Georgia Tech. They swept NC State this season. Georgia Tech um, outscored them by 16 runs, but a lot can change in the course of a season. How differently do you think these teams look now than earlier in the year? Oh, they're completely different uh, from the, the fact that Marquise Grissom wasn't pitching earlier in the season. Now he's one of their guys, their go-to guys in a very pivotal game. Uh, and NC State, they start off 1-8 and eight in the conference, and now they're the best team in the conference practically. So uh, Johnny Butler wasn't hitting 400 early in the season either. So there's a lot of things that could, you could compare to earlier that you, you just wash that away. That, that has nothing to do with what they are now. They're a completely different team. Both these teams are right now. And the team waiting for them in the championship, Duke, is definitely a completely different team. They've won 11 straight. So, fellas, we appreciate your time and great stuff. We'll see you a little bit later. Roddy, enjoy it from the field. Danny, enjoy it from your house. We'll see you guys. Thanks, guys. Thanks, guys. Oh, we're going to stay on this like this. Okay. Uh, I'm not going to make you guys make a pick, though. But, uh, <laughs> I thought it was just going to come back to me and you. I know. I thought we'd chat it up for a little bit and say goodbye. But, uh, yeah, thank you, guys. There Appreciate that. Go. A lot and easier. Now All right. we're going to go out to uh, Mike Morgan, Gabby Sanchez on the call right there at Truist Field. And we'll see you back here after the game. <laughs>
and Georgia Tech. And with that, we say hello and welcome. He is the former All-American at the University of Miami, Gabby Sanchez, and I am Mike Morgan. Gabby, that first game, if, if the first game is any indication, we're going to have a lot of fun in this one and then, of course, tomorrow for the title game. And you're right. It was the Joey Loperfido show. But I've got to give some credit to Luke Fox because he was absolutely outstanding. The freshman came in, went seven innings, using his fastball all over the place. He was using his slider, and he kept those Virginia hitters off balance. And then all of a sudden you had... Marcus Johnson come in and completely shut down the game. It was an impressive first game, and Duke goes to the championship. Fox easily one of the best performances of this ACC championship thus far. For Georgia Tech and NC State, they hope to have similar performances. For Georgia Tech, it's really been about their offense all year long. They have been consistently one of the best hitting teams, not only in the league, but in the country. Yeah, they do a really good job of working the count. They work the pitchers. They hit their mistakes, and that's the biggest thing. When you fall behind to a hitter, you need to make the pitcher pay, and that's what they've done all season, and they did it again in the tournament. And you see where that offense ranks first in run score. That's the most important number. Average third, hits first, doubles first, top to bottom. It is a lethal lineup, and NC State's not to be outdone. They could be pretty lethal at the plate as well. You talk to scouts around Charlotte, and they are as loaded as anybody. First team, all ACC selections, Johnny Butler, Terrell Tatum, Jose Torres, and more. The Wolfpack can hit you up in a number of different ways, and they are hungry after getting off to a rough 1-8 and eight start. They've been one of the hottest teams in the ACC. What do you love most, Gabby, about this NC State squad? Well, one through nine, you could get hurt. And that's what every coach's dream is, is to be able to put out a lineup where every single guy in that lineup can hurt you. Tyler McDonough has been unbelievable. Johnny Butler, what a season he has had. 395, 12 home runs, and 41 RBIs. Unbelievable. Well, if you like legacies, you come to the right place. We've got a couple of them in this game. How about Marquise Grissom Jr.? If you're a Braves fan or a Dodgers fan, you're very familiar with that name. That is his son. He's not known for his hitting like Pops, <laughs> but he's got one heck of an arm. No, he's not known for his hitting, but boy, does he have a good arm. 90 to 96 mile an hour fastball. He's got a two-seamer, 90 to 92, a slurve and a changeup, and they're going to need him to go deep in this game. Austin Moore will start things off for the Wolfpack, hitting 323 on the year with seven home runs. Four for nine so far in this tournament is Murr. NC State comes in as the number three seed. They finished second in the Atlantic Division, ranked in the top 20. Georgia Tech, the number two seed, the champions of the Coastal Division, 21 and 15 in ACC play in the regular season. What are we looking for out of Marquise Grissom Jr. on the mound today? Well, it's actually what he's doing right now. He fell behind 2-0, which you do not want to do that against this NC State team because they can make you pay for it. But it's using that fastball, getting ahead with the fastball, staying down in the zone. This NC State team can hit the ball out of the ballpark. You don't want to get that ball elevated over the strike zone. You want to keep it down, make them have to go down and get it. Pitch is top foul. And the full count continues for the NC State first baseman. For Marquise Grissom Jr. too, quick outs. You want to be able to limit your pitches. You want to be able to get into that sixth inning. If he's able to get into the sixth innings, I think he's going to give Georgia Tech a very good chance to win this ball game. Murr on an eight-game hitting streak. Now, he thinks that's with ball four. But the call was strike three. Murr was halfway down the first baseline when the home plate umpire Perry Costello said, take a detour, young man. That's strike three. It's a good fastball. It's right there close to the inside part of the plate. you got to be able to protect that pitch. He thought he walked. He's halfway down the line until he realizes that the ball was getting thrown around. Murr is retired on the strikeout, and that'll bring up the dangerous Tyler McDonough. 
McDonough a switch hitter, the center fielder. Home run cut comes up empty. One ball, one strike to the sophomore out of the state of Ohio. What a year for McDonough. 353 batting average, 13 homers and 37 runs batted in. McDonough five for eight with a pair of doubles in the tournament. Oh, he's been hot and right now for Marquise Grissom Jr. Just continue, just got to get ahead, got to get some quick outs, use that fastball a lot, but then you got to mix in your, your, your change up. You got to mix in your slurve. You don't want to just keep going after guys with your 95. Your arm will get tired. Off the plate outside. Grissom really pitched well in his last two starts. Won a win, won a no decision. That ball scorched foul into the seats down the line. He was hampered by a back injury at the beginning of the year, so did not pitch a whole lot for Georgia Tech, which is why the numbers are not exactly eye popping. This is only his sixth start of the year, but they believe in time. Not only will he be a weekend guy, he's got the opportunity to be an all conference guy, if not more. Swing and a miss, and the bat goes flying toward the Wolfpack dugout. So two strikeouts. Uh, just another good fastball. You see the good arm of Marquise Grissom Jr. 95 miles an hour on this pitch. It's a fastball. It's up in the zone. You get the swing and you got a little bit of a sweaty batting gloves I think over there with the uh, with the Hiller Tyler McDonough coming up there and back gets flying. Now the batting champion of the ACC Johnny Butler a 395 average for the year. At one point he was hitting 400 coming into this tournament just one for seven so far in Charlotte. And Grissom is just dealing here in the first inning. Oh that's what you want to see out of Grissom starts him off with a slur for a strike. Then you think the fastball is going to be coming because he's got a 95 mile an hour fastball. He drops the change up away on you. Swing and a miss strike three Grissom strikes out the side. One, two, three, nothing across for the pack. The Yellow Jackets coming up. Five, four, three, two, one, here we go. Here we go. NC State, Georgia Tech, two of the best teams all year long in the ACC and two of the best offenses. We saw what Marquise Grissom is going to do to combat NC State at the plate. Now we get to see Sam Heifel against a high octane Georgia Tech offense. Yeah, and this Georgia Tech offense, especially as of late, they've been playing some good baseball. Had an unbelievable game against Louisville where it was just back and forth juggernauts throwing haymakers at each other. And Georgia Tech was the one that came off on top victorious, and everybody contributed in that game. We got a freshman on the mound for the Wolfpack. His name is Sam Highfield, a 6'3 freshman out of Apex, North Carolina. Well, we just finished seeing in game one a freshman of Duke going seven innings and pitching outstanding. And Sam Highfield, he probably saw that too and said, I want to match what he did. And, and he's got a fastball 90 to 94. He's got a slider 79 to 81. But the best secondary pitch that he has is his changeup. Jumping on the first pitch is Waddell. And that'll be an easy play for Torres. Only fitting that those two would combine. That gives me an opportunity to mention this game features two of the top rated shortstops in the country. Waddell for Georgia Tech and the man who made the catch, Torres of the Wolfpack. D1 Baseball has them both ranked very highly. Two of the top three in all of college baseball. Here's Gonzalez. Liar. Gonzalez, a freshman 
enjoying a fine year, hitting 292. Again, Georgia Tech, the coastal champions, and yet we know they're not going to host a regional because they were not one of the 20 teams on that initial list a couple weeks back, and that would be kind of a sore spot not only for the Yellow Jackets, but I think the ACC as a whole. Every time a team from the ACC that's won the Coastal has hosted, and that was a sensitive subject for Danny Hall in his 28th year. How about this? Danny Hall and Elliot Avent, there are 10 coaches, active coaches in Division I baseball with over 1,000 wins. We've got two of them in this game. On two hops to the second baseman, Jarrett. Two up, two down for Highfeld. Let's get to know the Yellow Jacket, shall we? We talked about the prowess at the plate, 21 and 15 this year in the ACC. They were picked third in the Coastal. They exceeded expectations and won the division. Five starters hitting over 290. They can rake. When you look at them statistically, Gabby, pitching-wise, defensive-wise, there is not a ton to brag about. But offensively, they've been able to just rake against everybody, and that's how they've been winning games all year long. Yeah, you talk about the pitching bullpen, you talk about defense, and it's definitely not up there in the ACC. But what is is scoring runs and hitting, and that's exactly what Georgia Tech has been able to do. They've just been boat racing guys, and they put on big numbers on the board. They put pressure on the other team to have to score as much as they've scored, and they've been winning ball games because of it. We talked about the talented freshmen in this league. One of them is at the plate, just a freshman, Kevin Parada, out of Pasadena, California. 328, seven home runs on the year. And if you know anything about Georgia Tech baseball over the years, they have been as close as any program in America to being catcher you. When you talk about names like Veritech, Weeders, Joey Bart, a recent first round draft pick, you're talking about guys with long careers in Major League Baseball, prolific careers with the Yellow Jackets, and this is the next guy in line. Yeah, I just love the way that Kevin Parada goes about his ABs. He does a good job of not expanding outside of the zone. He knows the strike zone, and he puts some good swings together. And if you go ahead and you make a mistake against him, he is making you pay in a big way. Sizzler to third, scooped up by Menchie, fires across the diamond, and each pitcher enjoys a one, two, three first as we head to inning number two from the Queen City. Now the North Carolina State Wolfpack. A lot of people believe this is the most talented team in the ACC. This is a team that has a chance to make it to Omaha. They got off to a one and eight start. They lost four of their first five ACC series, but here they are seeking ACC championship number six. They're one of the hottest teams in the league, and that man knows a thing or two about having some hot teams, a regular in the postseason. He's been to Omaha, 1,142 career wins for Elliott Avent, now in his 25th campaign with the Wolfpack, recently signed a new five-year deal, and he's very upfront about the fact that he's got just one thing missing. That's the Maddie. If he could get that, he's not going to be Mike Martin coaching into his late 70s. He just wants to finish up on a high note and then turn it over to his longtime assistant coach, Chris Hart, who he believes will be a great successor in time. Tatum, Torres, Tresh, Triple T coming at you in the middle of the lineup. Grissom struck out the side in the first and did so in rather impressive fashion. A two and one count here to the DH Tatum. Tatum has struggled in the tournament 0 for 7 thus far. He has driven in a run. Collierville, Tennessee, suburb of Memphis. That's where Tatum hails. And an all ACC season hitting 311 with 11 home runs.
Off the plate, outside, and the first base runner for the Wolfpack. The RPI is good, 36. The projection is a two seed. Now you win the next two games, and who knows, that two could quickly become a one. Yeah, I believe so. I think if they go ahead and win this tournament, I think they're going to be a number one seed for sure. Strike at the letters to the aforementioned talented shortstop out of Baltimore, Maryland, the freshman Jose Torres. In the air. Down the right field line, drifting into foul ground, and running out of room is Reed. So the reason why I believe that they will be a number one seed if they win this tournament, one is because I think that if any team in the ACC wins the tournament, they should be a number one. But if you look at what they've done in the ACC, it really uh, win percentage wise, they were number two. They were ahead of Georgia Tech just because Georgia Tech wins the the Coastal, put them at the number two seed, and put NC State at the number three. And just the way that they've been playing here as of late, just the type of players that they have, I think they've done enough to be able to give them that number one seed. Another pop-up. This is almost the identical spot. And again, it's Reed on the chase. And Reed makes the catch, doubling over the railing near the front row. Nice play by the right fielder, Stephen Reed. Oh, that's a very nice play. He gets all the way to the wall. He sees where it's at. The netting doesn't make it all the way. And the good part was that he makes contact, but he keeps his eye on the ball and is able to finish the play. He did rob the ball from a little kid, though. I, I hope yeah, he called time hope, and gave it to uh, him. That would know. be the nice move, yeah. <laughs> I think we can all agree on that. It, it looked good. He was under it. The fan is under it. He's like, oh, man, I had that. It was right in my glove. Oh, man. He seems a little gonna, distraught. We're going to have to send him a ball over there. Yeah. Well, it seems like I say this every other inning at this event here in Charlotte. As you see the foul ball. <laughs> well, give the young man credit. You got to get out of the way. He did get out of the way. I would, too, if I see Reed coming at me. Yeah. Oh, geez, that's a strong man coming at me. In there for a strike. What I was saying, every other inning, you're going to hear me utter these words today and again tomorrow in the championship game. Someone is at the plate who is an uber-talented catcher. In this case, it's <laughs> Luca Tresh. I mean, I've never seen a league with so many talented catchers. We're talking about future pros here in many cases. And you're right, just up and down. It seems like every single team that we see out there, they have that one guy, and it's been the catcher who's been the, the main guy on the team. Runner on the go. Bullet past the third baseman, Henry Malloy. It takes a ricochet, and that's going to cost NC State a run. Tatum clearly would have been waved and scored had it not been for a friendly bounce to the left fielder, DeLeo. Oh, you got Tatum running on the pitch. Gets the fastball, gets on top of it, and unloads. This ball was hit hard down that third baseline. Henry Malloy tries to make a play, and here's that ricochet you were talking about. If that ball stays down on that line, there's no way that you're getting Tatum out. The only chance that Georgia Tech had was that ricochet to DeLeo be able to get that in. Eighth double of the year for Tresh. More nearly would have gotten an RBI out of the deal. Nice play by DeLeo in left field off the unique carom at this beautiful ballpark, Truist Field, constructed in 2014. Here's Devontae Brown, seven-hole hitter, the right fielder. 
256 the average on the year for Brown. It's only well constructed uh, if you're Georgia Tech but if <laughs> but if you're Luca Trash you're going why could they do that just leave them a little bit more room out there. Get that double to score run. What I love about this ballpark first of all you can't. You cannot beat the setting nestled in the middle of uptown Charlotte but there's nothing cookie cutter about it. I can't stand cookie cutter parks. This has a, a bunch of kind of bells and whistles to it. No, this is absolutely a beautiful park. You got a little hill out there where I've seen a bunch of kids in left field sliding down the hill. So you got stuff for everybody, stuff for kids, stuff for the adults. Just a beautiful job. And then you get the scenery of being in the downtown area. RBI opportunity for Devontae Brown. A junior. Out of Noonan, Georgia, 5'11, 208 pounds, one for seven so far in the ACC championship. Three balls and a strike the count as Grissom looks in. Just off the inside corner. Grissom wanted it, didn't get it, and all of a sudden the sacks are packed with the Wolfpack. You know what though that's not a bad walk at all you have Devontae Brown up who has nine home runs 32 RBI's and the last thing that you want to do on a 3 1 pitch is leave him something that he can go ahead and crank. I don't mind the walk because now you put yourself in a position where you're able to turn a double play and get out of this inning. NC State this year when they score first 21 and 3 so they've got a chance to do just that if not put a crooked number on the board here in the top of the second inning again Grissom who was hampered by that back injury early has not worked a ton this year and so the stuff is there you saw that in the first when he struck out the side but he's still trying to gain some polish on his overall repertoire and a lot of these games for him a little bit of a teaching moment as well. Yeah, the biggest thing that I would tell Marquise Grissom Jr. is you just got to get ahead and you cannot continue to fall behind on these batters. Menchik one for three this year with the bases loaded. Voita Menchik out of the Czech Republic. I've caught a lot of baseball games in my time, Gabby Sanchez. I've never referenced the Czech Republic in any one of those games. <laughs> Voita, a sophomore from the Czech Republic, hitting 252 on the year. He mans the hot corner for the Wolfpack. Two for seven in the tournament. Again, Grissom flirting with the corner, just misses. One ball, two strikes, the count on the eight hole hitter for NC State. Popped up on the infield. Big break for Grissom and the Yellow Jackets as Will Height puts the squeeze on it for the second out. And I'll tell you who's happy about that. Marquise Grissom Jr. and that man, Marquise Grissom Sr. Now, if you're a Braves fan, that is a name in infamy. You might recall he recorded the final out of that 1995 World Series championship over the Cleveland Indians. And Marquise Grissom, not only a great player, but you talk to former players who got to know him during their time in the bigs. One of the better human beings that you'll find and an outstanding teammate. So terrific DNA for Junior who's on the bump here trying to get out of a mess. JT Jarrett the nine hole hitter at 233 on the year two for seven here in the ACC championship and he waves at that one it's 0 and 2. Man that was a good slider. 
And that's what you want to see out of Marquise Grissom. Last two batters that he has faced, getting ahead, making them chase that nasty slider that he has. He just finished throwing a really good one, starts middle away, breaks right off. And when you got a team that wants to be aggressive, it's an easy way to get them out. 0-2 pitch, race down the left field line. This will play to pair. Tatum scores. Teresh scores. They're going to go for three. Here comes Brown. Bases clearing double. And the Wolfpack lead it three to nothing. Uh, he went one too many times to the well. He throws the slider again, but this time it gets left up in the zone. And JT Jarrett makes him pay for it. Slider up, wanted to go the same kind of way outside for a ball, leaves it over the plate. And when you get a mistake, you need to do your job and make the pitcher pay. And JT Jarrett does just that. And Senior does not like it. Hit of the game for JT Jarrett, the son of Notre Dame head baseball coach Link Jarrett. And even though Notre Dame is no longer around, I guarantee you Pops is watching that one. Back to the top of the order in Austin Moore. Murrow for one, hitting 321 on the year, takes inside. Right now for Grissom, Jr., just do not, don't worry, don't start to think, don't try to overdo it. Just stay out there, continue your pitching. It's three to nothing, it's still early in the ball game. Your team can come back. You've got a very good hitting ball club as well. Lofted down the left field line, foul ground, and out of room is Henry Malloy can't track it down so we'll do it again one ball two strikes you know in contrast to the first game where we had two teams in Duke and Virginia that have deep really strong bullpens you could say that's a strength of their team that's not the case in this game so getting out to a lead taking some pressure off the bullpen for one of these squads huge advantage uh, it really is. It's a very big advantage to be able to get the lead and then to continue adding on. So for NC State right now, it's just adding on. You need to continue adding on to take more of that pressure off of your bullpen. Georgia Tech is not loaded with options, so they really don't want to have a hook situation early. This could be trouble and track down by the speedy Waddell, but a huge hit by the nine hole hitter JT Jarrett. Well, JT Jarrett gets that slider up in the zone and makes Marquise Grissom Jr. pay for it. Base is loaded and it is a base clearing double. Back with you from beautiful Truist Field in Uptown Charlotte, North Carolina. He is Gabby Sanchez, former Hurricane, Major League Base first baseman. I am Mike Morgan. It's the NC State Wolfpack up three and enjoying a lead. When they do that, they're awfully tough to beat 21 and three when scoring first this year. So the work is cut out for a Georgia Tech lineup that is more than capable of uh, putting some big innings on the board and here is one of the guys responsible for many of those innings this year Justin Henry Malloy the cleanup hitter and starting third baseman uh, what a great year for Justin Henry Malloy 296 he leads the team with 10 home runs and he also leads the team with 39 RBIs off the plate outside Henry Malloy does not offer a sophomore out of New Jersey. Both these teams really recruit on a national level. Uh, Danny Hall, Elliot Avent have built these programs up to the point that they can go into just about anybody's living room and get a look. And that is strike three. Got to get used to Perry Costello. He's not necessarily the most animated <laughs> behind home plate. I, I don't I don't I don't think he uh, says anything loud. He just punches you out. And this is a fastball. It's right there down the middle down in there the zone a little okay. bit. 
I don't think he lets anybody <laughs> else know. He just gives it to you a little bit late. Kind of a delayed punch out. Andrew Jenkins. I will say I like the way that Sam Highfield, another freshman, again, the freshmen have been impressive today. The way that he's been working, he sees that Perry Costello is giving him off the plate away, and he just keeps pounding there. And there, case in point. Highfield goes right to that target. And goes ahead in the count. No balls, two strikes on Jenkins, who's torn it up in the month of May, hitting 417, five doubles, a triple, four home runs, and 13 RBIs. All in 14 games of work, but he's disposed of quickly in that at that. Guys are starting to realize what's going on, that he's starting to go to that outside part of the plate, and he's getting that call out there. So as a hitter, you got to try to make an adjustment. What's the only adjustment that you can make? And that's just getting closer to home play and making that outside pitch a pitch that you can still drive. No, that's a great point. And again, Perry Costello has been a while. If, if been around a while if you've been following college baseball. So you know it's going to be a consistent zone. So if you see you're getting that, pitchers are getting that call off the black, then hitters will need to adjust. And right now, a steady diet of pitches from Heifel right near that outside corner. <laughs> There's no reason to change. Why would you? If you're getting the call and hitters aren't making the adjustment, well, I'm just going to keep throwing it out there until they do. Strike three. There it is. <laughs> it's kind of a delayed front punch. <laughs> We're right behind him, so we have to double check to make sure he rung him up but how about striking out the side and just the same thing just staying out there with the fastball and just controlling the outside part of the plate that is a veteran move from a freshman Sam Highfield now there's your bracket what a thriller it was earlier today Duke making history they have never made it as far as they have this year with a trip to the championship game, they'll take on the winner of this matchup between NC State and Georgia Tech. The Wolfpack up 3 to nothing on the strength of a base-clearing double by J.T. Jarrett, the nine-hole hitter. Now it's Tyler McDonough, who's had a fantastic year, struck out his first time up. McDonough's from Liberty Township, Ohio. He went to the same high, high school as one Eric Surkamp, former Wolfpack pitcher who had a great career and had a cup of coffee at the big league level as well. It'll be Mc, McDonough and the ACC's batting champion Johnny Butler and then Tatum. 2-3-4 due up against Marquise Grissom Jr. That's a big inning for Marquise Grissom Jr. Need to be able to limit that damage. Keep it at three. Get back into the uh, dugout. Let your hitters hit. The more that they score runs on you, the harder it's going to be for your ball club. Ball is sky deep right center field, but deep is part of the park. 400 the straightaway center here at Truist Field. And a noisy out number one for the Wolfpack. The, also, the, the other thing with Marquise Grissom Jr. too is he cannot continue throwing so many pitches as he's done in the first two innings. You need to be able to get those quick outs. And the only way that you're able to get quick outs is by throwing strikes early on. If you're able to throw strikes early on, you're making the guy swing. But right now, 52 pitches in two and a third innings is a lot. Johnny Butler. Average now down to 393. He came in to the ACC championship hitting over 400 on the air. The young man out of Illinois. He had 11 straight multi hit games before coming to Charlotte. I mean, he was flat <laughs> out raking, leading the ACC in batting, ranking in the top 20 nationally in that category. And he leads the team with 41 runs driven in. There's a whole lot of firepower in this Wolfpack lineup. One of the things 
kind of like what we were talking about with Virginia, but even to a, a greater extent with NC State, the expectations were high coming in. Again, scouts love this team. They're in abundance here in Charlotte, and they are looking at a lot of players you're seeing today in red. But they got off to just a rough start. There's no excuses for it. One and eight. Coach Avent says, I never lost faith in my guys and the way they bounce back. He said he's never been more proud of a team than this year's squad to be able to go through those type of issues. A lot of people were starting to wonder what the heck is going on. And then they found their way and now playing really as well as anybody in the league. Well, you see what you have in a team when things are bad and things are down, how they bounce back. And that is what Coach Haven went to go see. How is my team doing? They are struggling, but then all of a sudden they bounce back and have become one of the best teams in the ACC. And it's the fourth strikeout for Grissom. You see the recap for the Wolfpack. I mean, you lose four of the first five ACC series. Do you hang your head? Do you feel sorry for yourself? Heck no. You go out, you win four out of the last six. You come into Charlotte. You win that all-important first game. They had a game last night with North Carolina, and this is, again, this is the downside of pool play. Obviously, it meant a lot for the players involved because it's a great rivalry, but NC State already knew they were playing in the semis. North Carolina already knew they were eliminated. So, therefore, from a strategic standpoint, if you're... Elliott Avent, you're not going to throw your best arms. You're going to save them for the semis and for a potential championship game. Yeah, and that's the only thing that I do not like about the ACC tournament. Everything else, I love the pool play. I love how they do it. I just wish that maybe they did something differently rather than it just being the highest seed. Maybe that, let that be the second of, of how a team gets in. But I would love to see something where it's maybe a run differential. And then you can cap it. Cap it at seven runs so that a team is not going out there and doing stuff that they should and then disrespecting another team. But I feel like if you did that, at least it doesn't where you lose a game and you're like, well, we're out. Mm -hmm. Well, you're still in it. You can still get to the next round. Well, we were all talking about that over dinner. You, me, our producer extraordinaire, Billy Palladino. And I think by the time you hit the third appetizer, you were on to a number of different theories. <laughs> <laughs> that was an hey, impressive we, throwdown last hey, night. We, sh we, we shared all the appetizers, <laughs> all right? It wasn't just mine. Oh, goodness. There you see. So NC State goes one and one, and, and I get asked this question a million times. What do you do for the tiebreaker? It's pretty simple, actually. It's the team that's the got highest the highest seed. seed. And, and that's one of the things I actually do like about the way it's set up. To me, what you do over the course of 30, in this case, 36 games, uh, is more imp impressive to me than what you do over three, four days in a conference tournament. So I I'd like some reward for those teams that perform well all year as opposed to a team that just gets hot one week. I know, but the fans want to see meaningful baseball games. True. They don't want to see where a team knows that they're in and they say, you know what, we're just going to go ahead and throw three or four position players because we want to save our pitching. Right. I can see both sides of it. I, and having done a number of tournaments that are just the pure double elimination format, which is what you see in some of the other Power 5 leagues, such as the SEC, there's good and bad there, too. You yes. could make the argument, well, those games are all meaningful. You could also make the argument you tax your pitching. If you, if you go through the loser's bracket, uh, do you want to go through all that and, and burn out some of your arms as you get ready for regional play? I mean, there's arguments really on both sides. I don't think there is a perfect formula, uh, but I do think they're on the right track with pool play here. Uh, I think there's a lot of good things about it. Yeah, no, I love the pool play, and I think the pool play is awesome, and I like the way that they do it. I just wish that it just didn't go to the highest seed because there are teams out there who have been playing good, and fans, and me alone, I want to watch a game where the teams are going out there and they're still giving it their all and not backing off because they know, well, we already beat this team, so we're already going in mm -hmm. to the semifinals, and we, because then it's not fun games to just watch and call. Runner on the go, pitch is swung on and missed. A good looking throw by the catcher Parada, who's got a fine arm. But Tatum beats the wrap at second base. I, I just think that they just didn't 
Rohite didn't get a tag down, and that's the only thing that I can think of of why this wasn't called because it looks like the tag would definitely have beaten him, but I don't think he got a tag in on the leg. Danny Hall is already out arguing. So this might get a second look here. Now here we're going to be able to see it. See the left hand. I, uh, if, if the tag connects, if the tag, he's if, out. If the tag connects, he's out, but. But I can't tell if the tag was made. Right. And that's going to be the hard part here. There needs to there needs to be something. There's no batter's interference, so that's not anything. No. He's in the batter's box. It's here on the tag. If he tags him on the leg there right. on the hip, he's out. Because the throw beat him, beats him there. There's yeah. no question about that. And again, as you mentioned earlier, got to have indisputable video evidence. So do we have indisputable video evidence that the tag is made right there? Gosh, that's so hard to tell. <laughs> I mean, you couldn't do a better job with the camera work and the freeze frame. I still am not a thousand percent sure. Here's what I've learned. Doing a number of games throughout the years since replay was introduced a few years ago. If it's a bang bang play on the bases, unless it is a thousand percent evident that they missed the call, the call is going to stand. Yeah. I, I think what they're going to look at is whether or not the tag would, was administered. So if the tag is made, then he's out because he did that. The tag would definitely be there. This might be our best angle to see. And even that, I don't know. I, don't I, know. That's I, my I cannot point. tell you 100 percent that that tag was made. So I'm going to have to stick with what's called on the field because the umpire is right there looking at it. Jeff Gosney is right all over this play, and he put himself in an angle to see the tag. So I don't know. And you can't get a better look than we just showed you. So my guess is it'll it'll stand and it does. And, and that is, you know, I'm going to say this. People love to bag on umpires. It's I think some people go to the ballpark. That's their number one thrill <laughs> is to just yell at umpires for three hours. It's been my experience in this league and other leagues. Plays like that, they get it right the overwhelming majority of the time. They definitely do. And there's been a lot of plays where by just looking at it live, it looks like they completely blew the call. And then when they show it on replay, you're like, oh, wow, oh, they actually got that one right. right. So play resumes. Tatum in scoring position, two down. Wolfpack trying to get a hit here, which would likely equate to the fourth run of the game. It's Torres the batter. Torres, a freshman from Baltimore, Maryland. Two for ten here for the ACC championship. He started off slowly and then really cranked it up late. Upped his average 50 points over the final 15 games of the season. The glove is already there. The hitting, they believe, will just only get better in time with Torres. Definitely not having a bad year this year when it comes to hitting and average wise. I guess the only thing that they can say is maybe the power numbers going up a little bit more, especially now that all these shortstops in the big leagues put up some big numbers with the bat. And again, again with Torres and Luke Waddell of Georgia Tech, you're looking at two of the top three rated shortstops in the country. Two, two popped up a mile high on the infield. Will Height calling for it, ranging over and makes the catch for out number three. So Grissom avoids any damage. Still three nothing Wolfpack. Doesn't get any better than this. You're in for a special treat tonight. Let's have some fun, everybody. 
coming down to nine innings. You leave it all on the field, you lose, you go home, you win, you go to Omaha. Now, there's been plenty of fun to be had in Charlotte in this event, which started on Tuesday. We're in the second semifinal game. Mike Morgan, Gabby Sanchez, one of the top leagues in America every year in college baseball. Right now projected to have nine teams in the field. That doesn't include Louisville, who certainly would be on that bubble as we speak. Right now, D1 Baseball has the Cardinals as number one on the first five out so the potential is there for ten bids minimum of nine you would have to think for the ACC and you would expect some representation in Omaha as well Elliot Avent has been there Danny Hall of Georgia Tech's been there three times although they haven't been out there since 2006 and that is certainly the goal and part of the discussion back in Atlanta do they have the team to do it this year? There you see the first five out, and there is Louisville. Last five in, the Tar Heels with that win. And that's why that game certainly was relevant for North Carolina. They did have a lot on the line, and it might be the, the, the win that propels them from on the bubble to in the field. I, I agree with a lot of what D1 Baseball has to say, but on this particular subject, I think they got one wrong there. I think Louisville definitely does make the tournament. You can't just go ahead and say a team that's been in the top 10 basically the whole entire season. Yeah, they did have a little falter there at the end after taking 10 days off because of COVID. Not even their fault. They were playing against Pitt. They Pitt uh, had to go COVID protocol. And then all of a sudden they lost 10 games. And from there, they got cold. But then they came into this championship for the ACC championship they had a good first game in the second game they just got out beat by Georgia Tech but it was a heck of a game you gotta you gotta think that they're in the tournament Compton DeLeo and Will Height, the bottom third of the order up for the Yellow Jackets and by the way do not under any circumstances count Georgia Tech out they're in a three nothing hole here but Georgia Tech in the last 10 days had about three walk-off wins, including a memorable one against Louisville. And there you see the uh, RPI, and there's Louisville at 73. Notre Dame is no question going to be a host and a number one seed. Duke continues to move up the charts with that 11-game win streak. And there's NC State. And I, I, I mentioned, you know, during my time here, I've run into a lot of scouts because the uh, the buffet behind home plate, <laughs> which I've been known to frequent, uh, that's where the scouts like to hang out as well. Nice air-conditioned room, little chicken parm while you're watching the games. They all told me that the team with the most prospects in this field has been NC State. And that combined with the experience, combined with Coach Avent, and there's a thing or two about postseason runs, this might be the team that has a chance to go deep into the postseason. And they're only helping their case with every win here in Charlotte. DeLeo, the batter. The starting left fielder. Yeah, DeLeo with a 2-1 count right now. You've got to start chipping away. You got to be able to get some runs across on NC State. You do not want to get zeros continue to put up because they will put up some more runs. Two and two now to the eight hole hitter. Sam Heifel, the freshman has looked good so far. Young man out of Apex, North Carolina. Delino has been on base nine out of his last 15 plate appearances. Yeah, dropping down to that three quarters. And he'll do that from time to time. If he feels like a hitter is kind of on his pitches, he'll go ahead and give you a different look with the arm slot. Drop it down three quarters. That ball is going to have a little bit more movement. He will get a little bit of sinker coming into the righties. That slider, if he's throwing it from there, will get a little bit more side-to-side -side tilt on it. 
How much did that bother you if a pitcher did that in the middle of an at-bat change his arm slot? Well, if I didn't know that he did it, mm -hmm. I, I would just freeze up because right. there was no, there was like, wait, what just happened right now? He just threw from a different angle. Now, knowing that he will do it, it oh, is tough right. because you're looking at a certain spot where he usually releases and where he's been releasing, and then all of a sudden he just comes from down low. So you just saw that pitch, and it was right over the top. Here's the last two pitches. There it is. There's that slider. He drops down three quarters. That ball get, is going to have a little bit more movement. And then here's that last pitch straight over the top. So as a hitter, if I'm focusing on release point, I'm looking up right where he's been releasing. All of a sudden now, you drop down. You have just changed the release point where I'm looking at. Danny Hall being aggressive, 3-2 counts, going ahead and sending the runner. Jake DeLeo, he's up to bat. You can trust his bat. You know that he's going to put a good swing on it. He's not going to be going ahead and chasing completely out of the zone. So you can go and trust your hitter that if it is going to be a strike, that he's able to get a good swing on it. And that's exactly the rationale because Compton is not a base dealer. He hasn't attempted one all season long. You just want to get things moving. You have double play depth going up the middle. You got a three two count. You have a hitter who can handle the bat. If you guys get if you get guys moving you might get that second baseman to drop down or that shortstop and opens up holes. Again running and again fouled off at the plate. And right now as a hitter I just finished fouling that ball off but if you don't think that I could see that second baseman is the one that's going towards second base to be able to make the, the the out on the steal of the if I do miss it, you would be crazy. So now I'm just trying to stay inside this baseball because now I know second baseman's going to cover, and I have a huge hole at second base to be able to get myself an easy hit. Great battle here by the talented freshman Jake DeLeo, the number eight outfielder prospect in the country coming out of high school. Another foul ball, this time in the air, near the dugout and out of play. DeLeo's part of back-to-back -back top 10 recruiting classes for Georgia Tech. They have recruited extremely well the last couple of years. I mean, consistency has been a staple of this program overall. And then a few years ago, they hit a stretch where they failed to make the tournament three out of four years. And that, that just sends shockwaves throughout the Georgia Tech program because they expect to go there every year like the Florida States and Miami's and so on and so forth. But they believe with these recruiting classes they'll be well on their way. Throws the bat at that one and just hits a soft fly into shallow right. Brown makes the catch for the out and the lengthy battle between Heifel and DeLeo is over. Just in protection mode getting that pitch and just softly hitting it to right. Great job by Drew Compton to be able to hear it, pick up the third base coach, and make his way back to first base. Nine-hole hitter is Austin Wilhite. Hitting 261 on the season. Wilhite, a senior from Buford, Georgia, hitless so far in the ACC championship. Played with his twin brother Nick with the Yellow Jackets from 2017 to 2019. And lines one down the right field line. That's a fair ball, and here comes Compton digging for third. Compton will get the stop sign, pull up the brakes, and they'll be at second and third for Georgia Tech. That's just a great job of hitting by Austin Wilhite. He gets that fastball. It's middle of the plate. And all he's trying to do is stay inside this baseball. You see the swing. It's almost like an inside-out swing. Derek Jeter is probably one of the best ever to be able to swing that way and does just that. I think Drew Compton got a little bit tired after the four <laughs> or five attempted steals because, boy, he was huffing and puffing getting to third base.
He got his cardio in for he the day. His, he was thinking, I've got a what now? I've got a score from first on the ball? I am exhausted here. He is. He's huffing and puffing over there at third base. <laughs> you know, meeting of the minds on the mound. Sam Heifel trying to minimize the damage here with two in scoring position and one out. Uh, we got Compton now remember he took about six or seven steals and this ball gets hit and he's running and you could see it's just I, I can't anymore there goes the helmet that's flying I just I've been there I'm, I'm just tired yeah <laughs> just can somebody else score me come on Luke get me in buddy Luke Waddell hitting lead off and scorching the baseball in the month of May at a 383 clip Now for Luke Waddell, it's just looking at what the defense is going to give you. They're giving me the whole entire middle. They're staying back. I have an RBI situation. It's a three nothing ball game. We need to get some crooked numbers on the board. To the right side, tricky hop for the first baseman Murr, who tosses to the covering high fell. Beautiful play. A run does score. The Yellow Jackets on the board, so give Waddell an RBI ground out. Boy, you think that this is just going to be a nice, easy, routine ground ball, and it was not that. But we're going to go back to the double first because this is what got everything going. This ball gets hit down the right field line to get a couple guys in scoring position with Drew Compton making it to third base and Austin Wilhite to get the second, and Luke Waddell does his job to score the run. Inside corner for strike one to Gonzalez. Gonzalez, one of those talented freshmen I was alluding to. He's out of Sandy Springs, Georgia, near Atlanta. Mount Vernon Presbyterian High School. Sox one to left. Butler is on. And he'll make the play for out number three. Yellow Jackets push a run across. It's a 3-1 game through three. Beautiful uptown Charlotte, North Carolina in the shadows of Bank of America Stadium where the Panthers play. We are at Truist Field where the Charlotte Knights play. It opens its doors in 2014. This is one of the prettiest AAA ballparks in the country. This is the first time in 47 years that Charlotte has hosted this event. I doubt it'll be the last. Couldn't ask for a better host city. And that man, well, he, he brought his game face here today. Let's just say he's feeling no pain. We've all been there. I've got to say he's been here the whole day. It's been hot. The sun's been hitting him. And when the sun's hitting you, it's like you're out on the boat. You take a little nap. Yeah. He's saving his best stuff for the latter innings for another fantastic finish. We've had several in this ACC championship so far. Luca Tresh starting things off. He doubled back in the second inning. Fresh had been mired in an 0 for 9 slump with seven strikeouts before he singled back in the second inning. Dude, I'm seeing, I'm seeing the. It's a double in the second inning for Luca Tresh. One of the many talented backstops we have in the ACC this year. Tresh from Safety Harbor, Florida. Cousin of former New York Yankee Tom Tresh, a two-time All-Star and 1962 AL Rookie of the Year. Smokes one, high and deep to left field. In the corner, it is gone! Luca Trish goes yard. 12th home run of the season. Slump no more. 
And that is how you break out of a slump. You get a pitch, it's a fastball right down the middle, and there's that little bat flip of, yeah, I got it, I know I did. Let's go ahead and put one on the board and get that run back that we just lost in the bottom of the third. Rounder to Waddell. And that will retire Devontae Brown. Now NC State talked about how good they've been offensively this year. First in batting average, first in runs scored, second in home runs. That's the 75th bomb of the year launched by the Wolfpack. And the first home run of this ACC championship for NC State. Eight hole hitter, Menchik. Wolfpack came in. They had a launching pad going over their previous five games where they hit 15 home runs. And then the bats, at least from the home run standpoint, got silenced a bit. And that was before Luca Tresh rockets one. The end of the left field corner seats. Or should I say picnic tables over there? There's that picnic table. There's a little corner club. Yeah. You can get yourself a beverage and then sit down and watch the game. Maybe we can send one of that gentleman <laughs> over there in the front row. I think he's good. <laughs> <laughs> two balls, two strikes, the count. On uh, the Wolfpack, third baseman, Voita Menchik. You can bring the trainer out. I guess they're going to see if there's something that's going on. Some pain. I believe that's. Danny Burrell, the pitching coach out there. In his second year on the Georgia Tech staff. They really, Danny Hall, one of the things he talked about, he loves his staff. And one of the guys they brought in, James Ramsey, who was at Florida State for a while and did a terrific job there. You know, the, the knock on Georgia Tech for a bit was too many strikeouts. And if you've ever watched Florida State, that was the trademark trademark of a Mike Martin squad. They grind out at bats. They do not just give in on two strike counts. And they cause deep counts and cause pitchers to throw more pitchers than they would want to. And it looks like Grissom is OK. I don't know what they saw. So this is going to be the last pitch that he threw. He throws the ball, ball gets out there, hat comes off, head down, puts the hat back on, looks kind of where the dugout is and starts oh, okay. to grab that calf. So it could be some uh, issues with some cramping in that calf. Well, it has heated up a little bit. Around game time, it was about 80 degrees. There you see Bart Nicky, one of their top relievers out of the bullpen. Not as hot as it was the first few days here in Charlotte. It's cooled off a little bit today. It'll cool off even more tomorrow. Should be perfect weather for the championship game. We'll be with you at noon on ESPN2 for that one. We know Duke, the Duke Blue Devils will be one of the teams taking part. Who will be the other, NC State or Georgia Tech? 85 pitches under the belt of Marquise Grissom Jr. Now, there's no question the bullpen is going to play a huge role in this game for Georgia Tech as you can't imagine Grissom being out there too many more innings. Swing and a miss, strike three. Boy, reared back and found a little something extra for his fifth strike out of the game. Yeah, I, if I had to guess, I would say that this is probably his last inning. But I tell you what, even at 84 pitches, he still has good fastball working. It's that good two-seamer down and in on the hands. 
but he's just thrown too many pitches. You can see innings two and three really hurt him with 29 and 26. In my count, that's 55 pitches in two innings. That's a little too many to be able to overcome. 91 pitches is his season high, and he's well on his way to hitting that mark. And right now, he's just thinking, I need to just get out of this inning. He's got a little bit of cramping going on in his calf. He's trying to stretch it out. He's given everything he has to his team, and that is something that they won't be able to take away from him. And it's on that plant leg, the back leg for Grissom, the right-handed pitcher. Got 92 miles an hour on that pitch. Count is 3-0 on JT Jarrett, who really has the hit of the game. He had the three-run double back in the second. And with Austin Murr coming up, I think that this is ball game for Marquise Gisham Jr. after this walk. Danny Hall might have seen enough. Marquise Grissom Jr., the son of longtime outfielder for the major leagues. Marquise Grissom Sr., former Atlanta Brave and World Series champion. Gave it everything he had today. Struck out the side in the first. And was one strike was one strike away from getting out of the second inning unscathed. But that three-run double by Jarrett came with two outs and really change the complexion of the performance for Grissom who will exit certainly better days ahead for that young man. You see the line score for the talented freshman who they think in time the sky is the limit for Marquise Grissom Jr. They've got a couple legacies on this roster. We might see Kevin Brown's son today out of the bullpen the legendary Georgia Tech pitcher one of the best pitchers in the history of the program and longtime major leaguer. And how about that? That is a that is a young picture picture of that's Marquise Grissom Jr. That's Kevin Brown's son as well. And they are both at a Dodgers game when Marquise was playing for the Dodgers. They're about three years old there. And that was an Instagram post from Marquise Grissom Jr. Little Tykes, that's just fantastic. Dawson Brown is the son of Kevin Brown, who we might see today. He's a freshman from Macon, Georgia. They have become good friends and have known each other, obviously, obviously for a long, long time. And maybe it'll be Dawson Brown who helps get Marquise Grissom Jr. off the hook in this game today. In the meantime, it's Luke Bartnicki. A 6'3 southpaw, the sophomore from Marietta, June, uh, Georgia, and he's been one of their top hurlers out of the pen this year. Yeah, he has. I mean, you look at the ERA at a 6.11 and 35 and a thirds inning pitch, and the reason why is it's those base on balls. You got to be able to limit those base, base on balls, not give away the free passes, but he does have 34 strikeouts and 35 and a third, so almost one per inning. And with his stuff wise, he's got a fastball. He's got a three pitch mix, so it's a fastball, it's a breaking ball, and it's a change up. He can throw them at any different counts, but he likes to go after guys with that fastball. And I'm sure some are at home are saying, well, wait a minute, how good could he be? Is 6'11 ERA? He leads the team in saves with six, and he's been pitching better of late. Of late. A scoreless in four of his last six outings. So I mentioned earlier the way Grissom's pitch count was racking up there. This was going to be a big day for the Tech bullpen. And it all starts here with Bartnicki. Murr is 0 for 2. Here's Luca Tresh. 
12th home run of the year. And the fourth run on the scoreboard for NC State. There's a strike on the inside corner. Both these teams have enjoyed some success in the ACC championship. Georgia Tech's won it five times. 2003, 05, 2012, and 2014. They've been to Omaha three times, all under head coach Danny Hall. 21 NCAA tournaments. Healthy fastball there at 92. And what we've heard about Bart Nicky is that he likes to go after guys. He's going to throw you the fastball. He wants to get you with the fastball, and then he'll go ahead and throw you the off-speed pitches, but. The old number one is the one he really wants to throw. Pitch is a ball and Parada will just put that one in his back pocket. That was stolen off the pitcher. Yeah, there was nothing that they were going to be able to do there. And Parada is just saying, let's worry about the hitter. But first move, he's going on the pitch. There's Parada. If he throws that ball, it's just for nothing. And that ball could sail, error, and then you got stuff going on. So good job, smart by Parada just to put that in the back pocket. Third swipe of the year for Jarrett. NC State will run on you. They've got some speed. Second in the league in stolen bases with 63. Murr, who has struggled a bit against lefties this year. 258 versus Southpaws, 355 against righties. Base hit could make it a 5 1 Wolfpack lead. Swing and a miss. Good job by Bart Nicky, but some damage done thanks to Luca Tresh. Uh, Luca Tresh gets a fastball all over the plate and does not miss it. Gives that nice little bat toss to let everybody know, yes, I did get it, and comes home to give a lead. Set to go at the top of the fifth. Mike Morgan, Gabby Sanchez. Fantastic tournament thus far. It continues with the final game of the day, the second semifinal. Duke won the first one. They already have a historic run in the ACC championship, their first title game appearance. The winner of this game will meet the Blue Devils tomorrow at noon on ESPN2. NC State leading it 4-1. to one. A three-run double by JT Jarrett. A solo blast by Luca Tresh. Meaty part of the order due up for the Yellow Jackets with Parada, Henry Malloy, and Andrew Jenkins. The game for Georgia Tech in the win against Louisville, that's one of the best baseball games you'll see. It lasted five hours and seven minutes, <laughs> and I was here for every one of them. And it had, uh, there were four times in that game where you were just convinced Louisville had won the game and Georgia Tech would go off quietly into the night. But 
This team led by Danny Hall has had a knack. Again, three walk-off wins in 10 days. There's a line shot, base hit. And if you're gonna mount a comeback, that's a good way to start it. Second time the Yellow Jackets have had the leadoff man aboard. Parada one for two. And, and just Parada, just again, we talk about all these really good catchers in the ACC and another one that in a couple years from now, we're gonna be talking about his name and him being in the top of that class to being in the draft because he is that good offensively and defensively. From Pasadena, California, that's when you know that ball's hammered, but hooking foul. Attaboy. Attaboy. Just a little bit ahead of it was Henry Malloy. He was a big part of that comeback win or over Louisville two nights ago. Justin Henry Malloy. And Malloy hits a rocket to second, the flip for one, throw to first, double play. Jarrett to Torres to Moore, twin killing. <laughs> There's nothing easier than when you get a ball hit this hard at you. It's an easy double play because there's no way that Justin Henry Malloy is going to be able to outrun the ball that he just finished hitting. That ball was absolutely lasered to Jarrett. And a wipe the bases clean for Andrew Jenkins. Jenkins, the hero in that walk-off mm -hmm. win against Louisville. Man on first and second with two outs, hits the line drive to left center. And ends up scoring everybody because the ball was just misplayed out there in center field. You can see the ball gets hit. They try to make the play, misplay, and as soon as that happened, there's no way that you're going to be able to get Justin Henry Malloy out. Yeah, Malloy winds up scoring the winning run Jenkins just a freshman he's another guy that got off to a rough start before he started to turn it on popped it up left side of the infield and it's Torres in the glove for out number three we are through four. Wolfpack lead it four to one. How about some local street art here in Charlotte? Got a little bit of everything. You good with a paintbrush or a no. pencil or no. anything? No. Other than a bat? Just a bat. <laughs> I can draw you a house uh -huh. with a chimney and oh, smoke like coming off, and it's going to be like a six-year-old drawing. Yeah, that's okay. In today's housing market, that'll escalate in value quickly. Mike Morgan, Gabby Sanchez, semi-final here in Charlotte. So many great things to do. That's the beauty of this ballpark is that you can make a day of it watch some games and then you can walk to a ton of different things whether it's restaurants or some other type of establishments with our with our man in the front row <laughs> might be hitting later on today well I, i'm gonna have to say this that every single time I, we're, i'm looking at the screen i see something that i didn't notice and i don't know how i didn't notice the yeah. dragon in center field right that's just sticking up but i was like oh i wonder where that dragon is oh there it is i've been looking at it all day mcdonough rolls one over to shortstop and the center fielder is retired as waddell makes the play for the first out here in the fifth these two teams. There's, there's the dragon. There's the dragon. I didn't even notice the dragon. And then all of a sudden, I'm like, oh, that's a cool dragon. Where is that? Wait, it's in center field. Oh, there it is. That is cool. I can't draw that. No, that, that's not easy to do. <laughs> I think every ballpark should have a dragon or some type of 
oversized reptile. I agree. Just They're adds to the ambiance. Look at. They are. Kids love it. You know the kids love that. Go take pictures with it. Sure. One gone for Johnny Butler. He's had a rough day at the office so far. 0 for 2. Came into this tournament hitting over 400. The average down to 390. I was going to say these two teams met back in the regular season and Georgia Tech owned the Wolfpack. Actually swept them. 9 to 2, 8 to 3, and 8 to 4 were the final scores. Outscored them 25 to 9, but again, this is a different NC State team now. And the way the Wolfpack are playing, that's why a lot of people were predicting, despite all the seeding, that NC State would be the team to beat. Notre Dame certainly had the best regular season, and I think they're a tremendous story no matter what happens. Uh, of course, they're going to host a regional. They were picked last. They wind up winning the ACC regular season championship. But by no means would anybody say that they are the most talented roster. That could very well belong to NC State. When you think about it, I mean, the, the amount of talent on the teams that aren't left speaks to the depth of this league. One of the deepest years, I think, in the ACC. And that's why they're going to get at least nine, maybe ten bids. That ball is hammered in the right field for a base hit. Butler's one for three. Seems like every time we're talking about strength in college baseball, the conversation begins with the same two leagues, right? The SEC, the ACC. All due respect to Pac-12, Big 12, Big Ten has gotten better here of late. Uh, it's been a good year for some mid-majors. A lot of good stories in Conference USA and the American. But the SEC and the ACC routinely lead the way. And they also routinely lead the way in terms of the amount of players on major league rosters. Not a coincidence. Yeah, and I, and I think that you're going to probably see two 10 team leagues going in with the SEC getting 10 and the ACC getting 10. I still believe that Louisville will be in there because right now they're saying that they're out. I don't believe that one at all. And with Notre Dame, you're right. They're not the most you look at them and it's not like, oh, high profile players, but they're the most consistent team mm -hmm. and they play really good defense. They've got starting pitching galore where they almost have openers is what they have. And they think Jared just throws guys out there saying, well, if he doesn't do good within the first two innings, that's fine. I've got nine other starting pitchers that mm -hmm. I can throw. And then all of a sudden one guy will give you the five, six innings. And he's done a great job. Uh, the most thing that they really preached on was defense. Defense was the biggest one. And they went from being last a couple years ago to being the best team in defense this year. Oh, and how about the story and Pitt's a great story in itself and they're going to be in the NCAA tournament. So you've got Pitt led by head coach Mike Bell. You've got Notre Dame led by head coach Link Jarrett. And although Mike Martin is retired how good he must be feeling. <laughs> Two of his protégés are now leading ACC teams into the tournament. That is out by a mile a perfect strike by Parada and you see just some of the tools by that talented young man. And that's why I'm telling you that in a couple years you're going to be hearing this man's name. He gets out there and fires a strike to second base and he is out in my opinion. There was I don't know why they're going to look at it. I guess maybe he tagged him too high but it looked like to me that he got the tag in before the hand gets in. It is close. It's a lot closer than the live look but I still think that he is going to be out of there. Yeah, I don't think this one should take very long on the replay. <laughs> I mean, just that was a good jump too. Yeah, it, it's not. It, it's not at all like Butler had a bad jump on that. Had a good jump, but Parada is just so good being able to get the ball out of his hand with some authority. And, Gets and it out quick and hard. Once this review comes through, the way you and I both think it's going to come through. Parada just made a little bit of history. That's the first time Johnny Butler has been thrown out all year. He came in 14 for 14 in stolen bases. Okay. 
Again, the question is, did he miss the tag? I don't think so. I thought I thought he had the tag on the upper, the lower back. Survey says, you're out of there. So much like we expected, the call will hold up. And again, blue on the field. Are we perfect today? We're perfect today. Yes, we are. Two for two. Pound yeah. It. Pound it. That's right. I've gotten better with these calls lately. <laughs> I was struggling there for a little bit. Two gone for Tatum. And that'll be a quick one pitch out for Bart Nicky, who winds up facing the minimum in the fifth. We're halfway home. Beautiful day, beautiful city, beautiful truest field, site of the 47th annual ACC championship. Not a better place in America to have it. Mike Morgan, Gabby Sanchez, been a lot of fun so far today. Been a lot of fun for us in the booth, a lot of fun for the players. A lot of fun for some fans, maybe even too much fun for a, a few. But how about our guy in row number one? You know what? Some guys are just, they're just primetime players. Now, you know, he was, he was fighting it earlier. Combination of sun and... Well, who knows what other factors there, but he's vibrant. The moment that the T-shirt mascot was coming through, he stood up. He was ready to go. He needed that power nap. That's all it was. Yeah, all you it know, was. you got that breeze coming in. It was hot early on. You get the breeze. It puts you to bed. He was taking his little power nap. He wanted to be able to finish this game off. You know, the most important part of the game right now, the late innings, yep. he's ready for it. He was not going to be denied that T-shirt. Got him, and, and what a catch. Yeah. That, the Dragon fired that one. Homer is his name. He, he fired that shirt. He easily picked it. Plus, plus fielding for fan in the front row. That's the scouting report that we've been issued. <laughs> Reed, Compton, DeLeo, 6 7 8 up for the Yellow Jacket attack. Georgia Tech trailing it four to one. State scored three in the second, one in the fourth. The Yellow Jacket lone run coming in the bottom of the third inning. There's a base knock to left field. Stephen Reed is one for two. And Georgia Tech, that's the third straight inning that they've gotten the leadoff man aboard, but give Sam Heifel credit. He has worked very well with traffic on the diamond. He has. That's, you're right, third straight inning. That's a second straight with a hit. Drew Compton in the bottom, in the bottom of the third got on by a via walk, but he has done a good job of being able to get out of those innings with guys in scoring position. Did it last inning with a 4-6-3 double play. Right now you have everybody shifted over. You've got only one guy on the left-hand side basically playing double play depth shortstop. Home run cut for the talented freshman Drew Compton out of Berkeley Heights, New Jersey, who's enjoying a fine tournament thus far, five for ten. Now, right now that was just too big of a swing, especially when you have the whole entire left side of the infield open for you. Right now it's about getting on base and getting runs for your team. Yes, you would like a two-run homer to be only down by one, but it's just getting guys on base and keeping that going, keeping the pressure on the pitcher, Sam Highfill. How about for Sam Highfield? Only 56 pitches so far in this game. Yeah, they've gotten all they could possibly ask for out of the freshman. One two to Compton, nowhere near. Right now for Compton, 
easy job, right? Choke up, you got two strikes, and just let that ball travel. If you let that ball travel, yeah, the fastball, you might be a little bit late, but that's kind of what you're looking for right now. But what it's going to do, it's going to keep you stay back on the changeup or the slider that Sam, Sam Haifa likes to throw. Rocketed deep left center field. And there to make the catch. The Butler did it for route number one. One gone for Jack DeLeo. With the baseball bat or the candlestick? <laughs> In the museum. <laughs> and you see the pitch count now at 62 for Highfield. This is not an overly deep staff for NC State. For that matter, it's not an overly deep team. And Elliot Avent will be the first one to tell you. He says, well, you know, we're basically winning with. 13 14 guys but obviously those 13 14 guys are really talented they just don't have the luxury of maybe some of the other teams out there in terms of a terribly deep bullpen a little power on the mound of I don't know why apparently they saw something from the dugout that they didn't like trainer went out there to check on Sam Highfield and, and see what was going on but it seems like everything is okay He's back on the mound to throw. Well, Jack DeLeo made him work the first time up. He did fly out to right, but it was an 11 pitch at bat. We'll see what kind of patience he exhibits here. Takes a pitch on the outside corner for strike one. Loves to drop down for that slider. And you know what? The more that he drops down, the more that I've been noticing. When he drops down, it's 90% that slider that he's throwing from down there. Mm -hmm. Trying to get a little bit more action to it. I haven't seen him throw too many fastballs from that angle. I think I only saw one so far today. When you face a guy like this, are you tempted to creep up in the box at all? Um, no, because he does have a fastball 91 and 93, so I wouldn't try to just start to creep up. What I would do is I'll turn the field around on him. So I would be thinking right center with the fastball. That way I'm still catching it somewhat out in front, mm -hmm. but then I'm able to get your change up and deposit it into left field. Two and two now the count evens up on DeLeo, the left fielder for the Yellow Jackets. Georgia Tech, the number two seed in this event. The Coastal Division champions. Bullet to third. They're going to go around the horn to turn two. Menchik, Jarrett, Murr, twin killing, and Heifel continues to weave in and out of traffic. Oh, that's two straight innings where a double play is able to get him out of some traffic. This ball gets hit hard to Menchik, to Jarrett, to Murr. Double play out of the inning. You wanted historical eight photos. We're bringing them to you. Over the 47 years of this great event, the ACC Championship has provided so many great memories, champions, and now venues. The first time it's been in the Queen City. And what a place for it. Duke winning earlier today against Virginia. They're in the championship game, first time ever. Oh, great play at shortstop by Waddell. Robs his fellow shortstop, Jose Torres, of a base hit. Oh, he, I don't think he saw the ball when Torres hits it. He's actually moving away. This ball gets hit. I don't think he sees it because of the shadows. Makes a wonderful play to get it back. Makes diving, gets up quick. Strong throw to first. Oh. 
We told you don't be fooled by Bartnicki's ERA. He's been pitching much better, and so far he's looked impressive on the mound. Yeah, and you got those shadows right now, and for a hitter, that is tough because the ball goes from light to dark, and it's not halfway. When it's halfway, it's really tough. Now it's a little bit more towards the mound. Let's take a look at our New York player spotlight New York life spotlight and there you see Luca Tresh two for two with a home run skyrockets this one to center but playable he just missed another bomb. Oh, he's feeling good at the play because even those shadows don't mess around with him he's still seeing the ball very well. Just gets a tick underneath this ball because it could have been a three for three day for him as well with two home runs and a double. Two up, two down, and here's the seven hole hitter, Devontae Brown. A walk and a ground out. It's not surprising that we'd see NC State play good defense. They played terrific defense all season long. In fact, right near the top in fielding percentage at a 985 clip. But Georgia Tech has struggled in the field at the bottom in fielding percentage. But so far, an arrowless game and a fine play turned in there by Waddell. Hey, if you're going to start playing good defense and pitching well and hitting the ball, it's the right time to do yes, it, it going is. into the tournament. Never too late to turn the corner and flash the leather. This is the sport unlike any other, though. You can really flip the script this time of year. I, I mean, Broadcasting a lot of football and basketball games over the years, you get to this point in the year, you kind of are what you are. You know, if you've been bad at something all year long, you're probably going to be bad near the end of the season. In baseball, you see it all the time. It's a team that struggled in one area or maybe multiple areas, and then they just figure it out, turn it up to another level, and they look like a different team in the postseason. Confidence. Yeah. And that's the word that it is. It's all about confidence. As all of a sudden, things start to fall in place. Guys start to hit, pitchers start to pitch, team starts to play really good baseball. Take a look at Duke. All of a sudden, 10 game, 11 game winning streak, putting everything together, playing really good baseball when it matters. Can of corn for Gonzalez and a nice 1 2 3 inning for Bart Nicky. 9 1 and 2 coming up for the Yellow Jackets. They trail it 4 to 1. When you think of man of the people, you think of Roddy Jones. <laughs> and there he is, charming, providing laughter for some of the coworkers here that are doing a great job on the ACC network for our coverage. A rather lengthy day here today with a doubleheader, but nothing's going to stop Roddy. Energy still at a high level. Georgia Tech could use some of that energy at the plate. They've been held in check thus far by the freshman Sam Heifel who is allowed just three hits and one run. His pitch count has been economical as well. 67 now 68. They have gotten all they could ask for out of the young freshman from Apex North Carolina. He's just been outstanding today and and when he gets into trouble he's able to get out of it. He's been throwing that fastball and he's been doing a good job of spotting the fastball down low. He will raise it up whenever he needs to. Good change up whenever he needs to. Good slider. He is just he's pitching beyond his years in this game and we've seen that twice already with two freshmen's back to back games doing the same exact thing. A rare three ball count. Will Height. Nine hole hitter doubled his first time at the plate. Three and one.
strike two. Maybe today is just the day for freshman pitchers after what Luke Fox did for Duke earlier. Hey, that's what it seems like to me. I'm seeing all these young freshman pitchers and not letting the moment get to them. They're playing in a very meaningful game to get to a championship ACC game, and they're just ice in their veins. Thirteenth start of the season for Highfield. Did he? Yes, he did. Linus Baker punches him out. Hmm. From here for a second, it didn't look like it. <laughs> so, so we have Luke Waddell coming up to hit. Yeah, that's not reviewable, by the way. <laughs> but I promise you this much. If it was, Danny Hall would be saying, take another look. There's a soft liner in the left field, a base hit. Waddell is aboard. I mentioned Duke already advancing to the championship game. One of these teams will meet the Blue Devils tomorrow. North Carolina State, all three games were postponed, so they never actually got a chance to go head to head with the Blue Devils. Georgia Tech did and wound up losing the series two games to one. Who does that help, you think? Because for me, I'm thinking that that helps actually Duke not being able to play against a team. You're, you're saying if NC State if wins? If NC State wins, I think that helps out Duke. Because? Because they haven't seen what Duke pitchers have. Right. They haven't seen. Now, Duke, on the other hand, is the same thing with NC mm -hmm. State. But right now, what's been really good with Duke has been their pitching and being able to be deceptive with right. it. So I, I don't know. I don't know who it helps, but I know one thing. It's very unusual. Because ordinarily, you've got two teams that faced one another in the regular season. And of course, guys like us would be to dissect what happened in those games and throw out a bunch of numbers and everything else. But but it, it would be a fresh matchup if it held up because again, they did not meet this season. Runner on the go, swung on and missed, no chance. Great <laughs> jump by Waddell. There, there was, I, there was no reason to do anything on that ball. This was just a complete stolen base. You see him take off. Kind of looks like that's how I would steal bases <laughs> when I was playing, because that's the only way that I was able to get there. It was reading the pitcher. Same same type of uh, one two looks. OK, we're going home and take off. Well, and Waddell is not exactly a burner, only the fourth steal of the year. Georgia Tech doesn't run much, just 29 stolen bags in 40 attempts. Okay, Pete. Okay, Pete. Only the third steal in the last 14 games for the Yellow Jackets. So Highfield wasn't exactly overly concerned about it. Now that shadow has gone beyond the pitcher's mound. Now the hitters can start to see the ball a little bit better. They're going to actually see the baseball rather than see a white dark coming in at you. And there you see the mound and home plate encased in shade. Sun still shining brightly on much of the outfield and the right side of the infield. Parada, dangerous hitter, chops that one foul. Parada in the three hole, hitting 330 on the year. Mentioned those names, Veritek, what a great career he had, both in college and the pros. Weeders, who was both a catcher and a pitcher at Georgia Tech. He was actually, he doubled up as their closer. I remember doing their 05 regional, he did everything. Great talent. Former high school teammate of one Justin Smoke also in the big leagues. Won't be long before Joey Bart is a regular behind home plate at the major league level and probably 
I hate to put this much pressure on him, but heck, he's heard it before. Don't be surprised if you see Kevin Barada at a Major League ballpark in time. <laughs> it has become catcher U on the flats of Georgia Tech. They play in a beautiful ballpark nestled right in the middle of Midtown Atlanta. So much talent just in the city of Atlanta alone. I mean, there's a lot of things going for Georgia Tech and that program. I mean, you could just have your just throw a rock and you're going to hit a future pro from the high school ranks in that area. But this is a, a year and a, a team where they want to get rid of a nasty streak. They have not won a regional since 2006. That is crazy to think. Uh, that, that number snuck up on me. Uh, 15 years for Georgia Tech, a program that has had so much success under that man, Danny Hall, in his 28th year, over 1,300 wins, three trips to Omaha. Ball is laced down the left field line. If it's fair, it's gone. It is a home run. Fair ball. And this game has changed big time. Barada with a blast. It seems like today when you're looking for something special, just go with the freshman. This ball is well struck down the left field line, trying to see whether it's fair or foul. Barry Chambers calls it fair. This ball, look, I mean, it's way out of here. And Barry Chambers, he's all over it, the third base umpire. And he's the one that signals right away that it's a home run. And to me, that's a home run. And that's number eight for Kevin Parada. <laughs> Waddle sat there and <laughs> stared. He wanted to make sure there's no question it had home run distance. It was just a matter of whether or not it was going to hook foul or stay just inside the pole down the left field line. Elliot Avent was immediately out of the dugout saying he wants another look and why not there's nothing to lose if you're wrong on the replay. But it's obviously a huge call and a huge play in this game. Georgia Tech hadn't scored a run since the third inning. Man gets a fastball and is, or slider sorry and is able to stay inside of this pitch to keep it fair down the line. There is nothing here that tells me that that is not a home run. Looks like it goes right over. Yeah, oh, yeah, that's more yep. than enough of a home run. That, that thing's about two feet fair for a home run. No question. Uh, the umpires are going to be undefeated in this game on replay. And as you pointed out, that's the third base umpire's call. We, we don't have left field, right field umpires. You just have the the four man crew and so it's up to the third base umpire to rush up the line to get the best angle he could and Barry Chambers did just that. Oh, he was right all over it the whole time and he did not make a call right away. He was looking looking he saw where it passed and that's when he said it's a home run and twirled around his fingers. Got a nice little breeze coming in now. We do. It's nice. Yeah. We're going to have even more of that tomorrow, from what I understand, if the forecast holds up. So this one, they might take some extra time on just because it's such a huge call. But at every angle that we see here would indicate, and you see at the bottom of your screen there, third base umpire Barry Chambers rushing to get the best angle he can. Every angle indicates for us. Well, wait, wait a minute. Well, maybe we don't have the best angle. 
Well, I will say that that angle right there shows that it's a home run. There we go. That's better. We got a nice magnified look at that. And I don't see. Oh. No, that. Foul ball. Yeah. No, on that last replay, I, on that last replay, I actually think they were right to overturn it. If, if we could go back to exactly what they just, yeah, what we just saw, watch at the tail end. But it's where it goes over the foul pole. Well, it goes to the left of it. See? It... Just back it up a little bit. Oh, it yes. does. Yes, it oh, does. Oh, goodness. No wonder Elliot Avent was it so adamant about does. it. He had a better angle than even we do on replay because he's on the first base dugout, so he is looking right down the third base line. And even with the, as good as our camera work was initially on those, you couldn't tell. But there, I mean, Elliot Avent is sitting there, and poor Danny Hall's got to be saying, come on, man. That's the play we needed. So change everything. It's four to one. The count is three and two with two outs. You know what got me? It was the cow. It was the cow. It was the cow. The cow is. Uh, the cow with the white. Yes. And that ball just goes right next to the cow. Blame it on the cow. cow. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, we've been here a while. No, I, I, you're absolutely right, though, because the cow is white. A little bit of black in the coloring there. But the ball is obviously white. Parada, meanwhile, draws the walk. So cross off home run in your scorebook. Put base on balls. A tying run will come to the plate in Malloy. I'm going to have to say that I'm looking at your scorebook, and you do have a pencil, which means that you can't erase it. I, I can. But, but you completely just scratched I everything. Just, I was so disgusted with the whole thing, I, I wasn't even going to put the eraser on it. I just I'm, did my scribbling best. I'm over here with a you whiteout. You whiteout? I mean, you're like teacher's pet over here. you got your whiteout. Your penmanship is spot on. I mean, look at that's beautiful. Thank you. You can't read mine. I have the... You, you yeah, have... It's not good. You, you have the doctor's handwriting. <laughs> exactly. I'll be writing out prescriptions <laughs> later on. Well, poor Danny Hall is... I, I don't... It's one of those, again, if you're... If you have the vantage point of Georgia Tech's dugout... It's a home Danny run. Hall, it's a home run. If you have our vantage point, which If you is have what our saw, vantage point, it looks a like home a home run. run. If you have the vantage point of where Coach Avent and NC State's dugout Who's is... Right down the line. Right down the line, you can, you can see exactly where that ball curls to the left of the cow. I've never said that term in the history of calling baseball games. It curls to the left of the cow. And here we are, four to one instead of four to three. That's what you love about doing play-by-play -play for baseball. You're always going to see something you've never seen, and you're going to call something you've never called. Now, if you're Sam Highfill, you got to watch out, because up to bat right now is Justin Henry Malloy, and he's got the most home runs on the team and the most RBIs, and he can do some damage. Eighty seven pitches now for the freshman high who gets a reprieve after serving up a long line drive, but just foul. Hey, uncle, baby. Ground ball to second backing up on it. Jarrett side retired. Huge recovery. A huge call on replay. That's why it's there. And we head to the seventh, four to one, our score. Hello, Mr. Cal.
kind of ironic we were talking about the impact of instant replay on baseball. Well, this becomes the call of the game, and it wouldn't have been called properly had it not been for instant replay. Called a home run on the field. But when you zoom in, and again, they have the high-tech DB Sports system over there to our right. So they're able to do all kinds of stuff to make it as crystal clear as possible. On that angle, the right call was made on an overturn of a home run ball hit by Parada. That would have made it a one-run game. Momentum would have been squarely on the side of Georgia Tech. Instead, Parada winds up walking. Malloy bounces out to second. Side retired, goose egg on the board, and the Wolfpack maintain a three-run lead as we are set to go in the top of the seventh. Menchik, Jarrett, and Murr, eight, nine, and one, do up for the Wolfpack. Inside to Menchik, who's popped out the second. He's struck out. Some home to some home now. Want to hear it? Young man from the Czech Republic, starting third baseman. Slow roller to first. Jenkins gobbles it up. One up, one down for Bartnicki, who's doing all he can to keep Georgia Tech in this game. What no one would have expected is Georgia Tech with just one run. So hats off to Sam Heifel and the performance he's put together. He came in with an ERA of four and a half. Georgia Tech has been scalding the baseball. But the Yellow Jackets one run on four hits. This ball will take a detour about 70 feet up the line and go foul. Yeah, you're right. They might only have four hits, but they've hit a lot of balls extremely hard. Adam balls is what I call them right at guys. Couple of them being turned into double play. So there's not much that you as a G Tech hitter can say, but hey, we hit the ball hard. It was just right at guys. But you're right, Sam Highfill, whenever he needed the pitch, he's able to execute it, get the ground ball, get the outs, and he has been absolutely outstanding. It looks like he's just going to continue going because we don't see anybody out there warming up. Well, as I mentioned earlier, this is not a deep pitching staff for NC State. They've been working the same four or five guys for much of the year. Got under it. Pop up. Shallow left. It's going to be the shortstop. Waddell making an over the shoulder grab. So two quick outs for Bartnicki. Bart Nicky's just been outstanding coming into the ball game and just doing what he needs to do, which is keep NC State from scoring. And that's a really good offense. And he's just been able to come in, throw the fastball where he wants it, throw his off speed where he wants it. And he's been doing a very nice job for Georgia Tech. Chop to first. What a quick inning. Jenkins unassisted. One, two, three inning for Bartnicki. Georgia Tech has had late inning heroics all year. They're going to look for some more. He's just a freshman. His name is Sam Heifel, and he is dealing today. Not only dealing, but he was absolutely nasty. Throwing fastballs where he wants, getting check swings, throwing the sliders, throwing the changeups, and doing it, throwing very minimum pitches. His longest was that third inning with 23 and the six. He got into a little bit of trouble of 21. A total of 88 pitches through six has been unbelievable. Hi, Phil. 6'3 freshman. Three times this year. Sam Highfield has reached the century mark in pitches, so we know he can go deep 
into a game. And as you mentioned, he's been economical, so this pitch number 90. They're going to keep riding him if he keeps getting outs. And you know what? It's been those low stress innings, too. He really hasn't been all that troubled with guys in scoring position or guys on base, so it's been low stress level pitches. Jenkins 0 for 2 today coming in on fire. 403 batting average his last 19 games. Andrew Jenkins when asked if you could meet anyone dead or alive who would it be Mike Trout. So he went with the live person he did. For me your trout would be in my top five. James K. P K. Polk would be in there somewhere. 11th president of the United States. I don't know he just seemed like he'd be an interesting. <laughs> like, not Abraham Lincoln. Nah, yeah. Polk, you know. Just I hear Pope, he, he was a fun time. Okay, I get you. Go ahead. I mean, I, me? We got you. We yeah. got you stumped on well, this I one. Well, I mean, there's just so many that I would like to. I like Babe Ruth. I would love to go grab a beer and a I'd, hot dog with him. I'd, I'd put Babe in the top five as well. That one gets away. Jenkins is aboard. Uh, this is the interesting thing about the outing today for Highfield. That is now the fourth consecutive inning that the leadoff man has reached. With a lineup like Georgia Tech and that type of number, you would expect to see more than one run on the board. You would, but in two of those innings, a 4-6-3 four, four, double play, a 5-4-3 double play. So even though he's getting the first guy on, He's been doing enough to get that ground ball double play going. Mm -hmm. I'm I'm Correct. That's four out of the last five. Will Height did lead off the sixth inning with a strikeout, but four times in this game now, the leadoff man has reached for Georgia Tech. But you mentioned two of the biggest plays in this game, those double plays, one in the fourth and one in the fifth. Those are deflators. It's, it's, it's not just the circumstance and the outcome of the play. It's psychologically how it takes you out of an inning. And NC State is, you know, they got the momentum with a three spot in the second, and they've just held on to it ever since. And not only that, they were both well hit balls yeah. so so they were both hit right on the screws mm -hmm. right at somebody which for a team you're like good lord if those balls are getting by all of a sudden we got movement and action going but you got to give credit to the NC State defense as well being able to make those plays on those hard hit balls and get the double play and talk about a clean game an airless game up to this point and NC State I always look at 975. If, if, if you've got 975, that's a good fielding percentage. NC State comes into this game 983. They have been outstanding in the field. High fly ball, deep left field. Butler backing, backing, makes the catch. Oh my goodness. Yellow Jackets cannot buy a break. My. And, and you have to see whether or not on the replay at second, whether he touched second base on the way back. I don't know if he did, but this ball was well hit and so unfortunate because of where it was right into the corner for the play to be made. Butler just does a great job jumping up, snagging the ball, and getting that ball in. I mentioned that this is a creative layout for a ballpark, right? There's nothing cookie cutter about it. The fence juts out about another five to ten feet right where that ball is hit. You see that uh, yeah. in left center field, that kind of unusual angle. And not only that, all of a sudden, 
clouds came over. It got a little bit darker. It got colder. We feel a breeze We're coming in. We're feeling breeze coming towards us earlier in the game. And, and earlier in the day, the wind was blowing out. We've, it's gone from 81 degrees to 75 with a breeze coming in. In short, that's a home run about an hour ago. And now, and now this is this is the the home run. So it goes. Now when you come back, you got to touch it. Does he touch the base on the way back? I don't know if that left foot touches it. We're going to take a look real quick. Does it touch the top of the base as he's coming back over? You've got to make contact with it. That's that's I don't know. I, I, I'm going <laughs> to need a little more than that. I, that's that's a tough one. We're trying. That just hurt my vision. Now, again, they might have another angle. That's not the one that's going to overturn. No, anything. that's not going to overturn a thing. The wind has picked up to 13 miles an hour, and I, I, as Gabby mentioned, we can feel it coming in. That ball is gone an hour ago. Yeah, well, I was looking at the flags about two or three innings ago, and the fl flags were straight out to left field. I'm looking at the flags now, and they're straight down, and even one's coming in. So we look at the flags right now, and they're straight down, but we can take another look at it. Oh, umpire, you're blocking it for us. That's the Linus Baker. He, he, yeah, he, he, he blocked got our best shot. He got us. Yeah. He got us. And there is Elliot Avent now in his 25th season as the head coach of the Wolfpack, an assistant coach before that at NC State took the New Mexico State job for pennies on the dollar when New Mexico State wasn't even in a conference in baseball they had no history they had no tradition people said you cannot win there whatsoever but he felt like if he was ever going to be a head coach at a high level he had to take the job did some good things in Las Cruces New Mexico and that paved the way for a trip to Raleigh as the head coach. That's impressive. That is impressive. That's impressive. And this might be more about arguing than anything. I think he's still asking about that play at second base. And while he does that, NC State has made the change. Sam Highfield deserves every bit of applause that he is getting from the Wolfpack faithful. You could not have asked for a better performance out of your freshman starter today against a lethal Georgia Tech lineup. Sam Highfill, six and a third, allowed just one earned run. He struck out five. He allowed just four hits. He's responsible for the runner on first base and a four to one lead. And we see one of the top guns out of the bullpen for the Wolfpack, Evan Justice. Ooh, Evan Justin just absolutely nasty 92 to 96 from a low three quarter slot slider has taken a big jump it's 83 to 86 he's thrown it a lot better with a lot more command what you didn't see there in that cavalcade of numbers is that he does lead the staff with seven saves nobody else has more than one for NC State so Elliot Avent is not taking any chances and he's not wasting any time. He's going with his top dog out of the bullpen with the runner at first, one gone, and Compton at the plate. Well, you, you, Avon knows what Georgia Tech has done, especially as of late and the way that they've come back. And you're not going to just go out there and throw somebody that you're not going to trust. You're going to bring in the guy that you trust the most to get you out of this inning and keep a zero on the board. There's a bullet. How about a third double play? Jarrett steps on the bag, rifles to Murr, and the Yellow Jackets have hit into three twin killings. Oh, man, how beautiful is this? If you're an NC State fan, ball gets hit hard. Jarrett comes, takes it himself, throws it across, double play. Georgia Tech hasn't hit into three double plays in a game all season long. They hit into three of them today. 
all in key spots. And NC State, as I mentioned, it doesn't get much better defensively than what the Wolfpack have put together in the field this year. They recorded two or more errors in a game just seven times. A 983 fielding percentage is about as good as it gets, and they have been up to the task, a flawless effort so far, and it's just it's wiped away any chance that Georgia Tech could get a big inning going. The only other chance, of course, was on a parada ball that initially was called a home run, later on review, turned out it hooked foul to the left of the cow on the pole in left field. And so here's NC State still clinging to a three-run lead against a team that we all know is capable of late-inning heroics. Dribbler to shortstop. Waddell vacuums it up and makes the play to retire McDonough. If you like double plays, how about a trio? Oh, you got a couple of them. All of these are hit hard. Jarrett to Torres to Murr. And then this one, Menchik to Jarrett to Murr. And every single one of these balls was hit hard. Even this last one, Jarrett takes him by himself to Murr. Just absolutely great defense by this Louisville Cardinals. Wolfpack outstanding all year long defensively. And now they're trying to get some insurance here. I got you. you got the wrong shade of red. I, it's okay. I got the wrong shade of red. That's my <laughs> fault, Wolfpack. Don't get mad at me. Don't start yelling at me. I apologize. Well, you're still making a strong case for Louisville I was in the NCAA tournament. In the NCAA, tournament. they're still in my frame of mind. Apple's ripped foul. Butler one for three today, a single and a pair of strikeouts. I gotta be honest, the, the, the game one was the kind of game I thought we'd have with Virginia and Duke. I did not expect four to one to be the score in this one in the eighth. No, I was expecting a 10-8 ball game yep. with a lot of offense, pitchers coming out of everywhere. I was not expecting for both pitching staffs to do what they have done against really good hitting ball clubs. Way to pull the string, Bartnicki. 76 miles an hour for the strike. You know, pitching and defense for both teams, stellar. Right now, the Wolfpack have the best of it, leading it 4-1. to one. Again, the winner plays Duke tomorrow. We'll be with you at noon on ESPN2. Can't wait for that one. A 47th ACC champion will be crowned the first time it's ever been done in the Queen City of Charlotte, North Carolina. Bartnicki continuing on his longest outing of the year. He's been great. And still throwing hard too. Still 92, 93 miles an hour. Velocity is still there. I was expecting at least at this point to see that velocity drop, but he's still got some in the tank. Sneak peek at the home half of the eighth for the Yellow Jackets. DeLeo, Will Height, and then back to the top of the order in Waddell. And the moment we start praising Bartnicki, a one-out walk <laughs> to Johnny Butler. That's what happens. It happens that way. Or maybe he's just seeing how everybody else is turning double plays and said, I want to have in on that one too. I'll walk a guy and see if I can get the double play. I doubt that's what he's thinking. <laughs> <laughs> it's a, as good of a uh, theory as any at this point. By the way, Georgia Tech this year when trailing after seven innings, one in 19, but that one win came on Thursday night in the memorable game against the Cardinals of Louisville. Tatum 0-4-1 has had some really good at bats. Walked his first two ABs and he even got a stolen base. Man on first with one out. You're looking at for him to just 
get something going in the gap. Try to let that ball get deep, especially lefty lefty. If you start to pull off on that fastball, you're just going to eat up a whole bunch of sliders and change ups away. You don't want to do that. So a lefty lefty try to think left center gap. Tatum's had a rough go of it so far in the ACC championship. After a great regular season. Junior from Collierville, Collierville, Tennessee. Scouts love the way the ball jumps off his bat. I mean, he's got what you would call sneaky pop. He's only 165 pounds, but he's got 11 home runs on the year. 0 for 8 so far here in Charlotte. 0 2 pitch, and he will wave goodbye. So the struggles continue for Terrell Tatum. Yeah, that. That front hip is opening up, and when that front hip opens up, a pitcher is going to see that, catcher sees that, coaches see that. You're just going to get a whole bunch of sliders from a left handed pitcher. You see, he's scolding himself in the dugout after that at bat. You were doing that between innings. It was quite a, kind of puzzling. I wasn't sure what you were upset about. I hope it's nothing I did. Very animated, Gabby Sanchez. Very hungry. <laughs> That's Sanchez. probably what it was. You were getting hangry. Oh <laughs> uh, well, we were just talking about how good Luke Bartnicki has been, and he has been. A season-long performance for Bartnicki. The time to tap back into the Yellow Jacket bullpen. Won't be long before nightfall is upon us here in uptown Charlotte. Beautiful sights of the Queen City. The second game of a twin bill here in the ACC championship. Duke defeating Virginia in game number one by a final score of four to two. And here we are, NC State leading it four to one. Luke. Bart Nicky allowing just one hit in four innings of work. He was terrific. Uh, I was just really pleasant to watch the way that he went out there and worked. Just absolutely nasty, pounding in, pounding out. His his slider today was working really well. And Chance Huff, he's coming into the game now. He's one to know a 9.74 ERA, 20 and a third innings pitch, 19 strikeouts. So the stuff is there. The only problem is he has to be more consistent over the plate. 16 walks will hurt you and get that ERA sky high. He's got a fastball, a slider, and a changeup. And it could be an electric fastball as well. Huff is rocking a strong mullet, and his stash game is strong. <laughs> I like the hair, the flow yeah. in the back. I like the stash too. You got the business up front, party in the back. Yeah. Good stash. Good stash. And we've got a ball. Hmm. I thought he stepped off. He stepped behind the rubber. You step behind the rubber, you don't have to throw it. If you step to the side, you do. I could have sworn he stepped behind the rubber though. Now this is not reviewable but the umpires when they converge could change it. Uh, that front foot kind of worked its way up to. That's typically one you're not going to win. When you are there's nothing there's nothing you can do about that yeah. one if they called it they called it whether you're right or you're wrong you can go back and look what I thought is if you step behind the rubber like he did he cleared himself behind the rubber that it wouldn't be a balk but he did have that front foot move first which that right there tells me that it's a balk some nifty footwork I'll say <laughs> that much line shot center field base hit Rounding third and coming home is Butler. Torres with an RBI single and the Wolfpack lead it by four. Oh boy, a big balk call. 
is what gets the runner in scoring position and Butler gets into scoring position because of it and ends up scoring on the line drive by Torres absolutely wails on this slider out over the plate hits it hard to center field. But the big one was this is what set up him being into scoring position. You see that front foot come up first and then that back foot. It's almost a balk kind of play is what they kind of run with that. Once you do that you better throw it over to first. Luca Tresh has had a fine day at the plate. A double, a home run, and three trips to the dish. Yeah, that last fly out to center field, too, right to the warning track, hit it really well. So he's hit the ball hard all three times today. The home run was his 12th of the year. Pop up and down this lineup for NC State. Oh and you've got McDonough, 13 home runs, Butler 12, Tatum 11, Tresh 12, Devontae Brown 9. And the way that they're able to spread it out too, because even Austin Murr has seven home runs. Mm -hmm. So just one through nine through the whole entire lineup are guys who can leave the yard or who at least have left the yard once this year. Runner goes, pitches low and away, no chance, and the ball will go all the way into center field. You, you like the, the effort by Parada, but that's one you're just better suited putting in your back pocket. Yeah, definitely an unnecessary throw. You had no chance. Parada, I know he's trying to make something happen, but this was just an amazing jump. He's off and running. It's a stolen base no matter what. It doesn't matter if you put it right on the bag. You got to just hold on to that ball. Don't make the unnecessary throw because now all of a sudden the unnecessary throw gets you an error and Torres at third base. That is the first error of the game. Swing and a miss. So Huff recovers, gets the strike out of Tresh, but a balk and an RBI single by Torres makes it a four-run game. Well, game one, if you missed it, you missed a show time performance by Joey Loperfito. How about two homers, four hits, two ribs, two runs, Loperfito leading the way for a Duke offense that scored four runs on 10 hits. And Luke Fox, the freshman pitcher, was the story. Much like today for NC State, Sam Highfield's been terrific. Fox was outstanding. He worked seven innings. He gave up just eight hits, no walks, and two runs. So Duke in uncharted waters. First ever championship game in this event. And they will take on the winner of this game tomorrow at noon. We'll have it for you on ESPN2. That's going to be the start of a great triple header of action on the deuce. We'll get you thing. We'll get you started with the ACC championship. Then the gang out in Hoover will have you set for the SEC championship. And then we'll take you to OKC for the Big 12 championship. Three great leagues should be three great games on ESPN2. Speaking of great, he's Gabby Sanchez. I'm merely Mike Morgan. Thank you for stopping by this Saturday evening. We've been here a while, but it's been worth it. Two really well-played games. Georgia Tech has six outs to rally from four runs down. Yeah, I got to say, it's easy to stay up and ready to go when you've had two really good ball games back to back and not getting one of these blown out games where there's nothing to talk about. This has kept us just talking about baseball and just having a good time. Uh, and, and they, like I said, they, they've, they're not only competitive, but really well played. Uh, great defensive plays, fine pitching performances. We've, we've gotten some barrels on the ball. A little bit of controversy never hurts. 
four really good teams that are all going to be playing in the NCAA tournament, but only one will be crowned ACC champion. Okay, fine, let's go. Georgia Tech hoping to tap into that cardiac jacket mode here. They've won three games in 10 days on walk-offs, including a memorable five-hour win against Louisville to third. Menchik makes the play for route number one. How about this cardiac play? It was the cow's fault. I'm going to blame it on the blame cow. Blame it on the cow. Who could forget that great hit song from the 90s, Blame It on the Cow. Uh, and then into the corner, another ball could have been another two-run home run. Just not to the right <laughs> spot of the game. You just can't get enough <laughs> of the cow. He's got a, a, a really intense look about the whole thing, too. He's kind of looking at us like, I could have told you that ball was foul. I'm looking right at it. It's a cute cow, too. It is adorable. And I love it. Eat more foul. Yes. <laughs> F-O-W-L. I don't think Danny Hall is amused by the cow, the play, or this game right now. He would love to see another fantastic comeback. He's going to have to do so with Nobody on, one out, and the nine-hole hitter, Will Height. And he waves goodbye. Overmatched. Yeah, that was overmatched and very well. And it, it, it was just, here's a fastball, here's another fastball, and I'm just going to throw this last one by you at 95 miles an hour. Two gone for the leadoff man, Waddell. What a great career he has had in Atlanta. Boy, Justice is just, he, he's got arms, he's got legs, he has everything flying at you. It looks like his body is going to third base. It's very deceptive for a hitter. And then all of a sudden, it's 94 coming at you. That ball's lined toward the corner, and that is a foul ball. Didn't need the cow to see that one. <laughs> but it's crazy the way when he comes up to go pitch, it kind of looks like he's going to fall towards third base. And then all of a sudden, you've got this whipping arm action, three quarters coming at you, and it's getting on you in a hurry yeah. if you're a hitter. That would, that would seem to me, uh, you know, and I represent the average person, not somebody like you that could hit a 98-mile-an-hour fastball. That, that would seem to me like one of the hardest things for a hitter is all the different deliveries and wind-ups to pick things up so quickly. Routine bounce of a shortstop, Torres. Money in the bank, and so has NC State been when leading after eight innings. How about 27 and 0? Wolfpack five, Yellow Jackets one. We have reached the ninth of this ACC Baseball Championship semifinal game number two. The winner meeting the Duke Blue Devils tomorrow at high noon. On ESPN2, Mike Morgan, Gabby Sanchez. By the way, a sneak preview of the forecast for tomorrow, Gabby. We have enjoyed this cool breeze that has come in, kind of cooled off the temperatures. Tomorrow, first pitch, the temperature expected to be 65 with a high of 72. I didn't bring a jacket. <laughs> I didn't either. <laughs> Might have to go to the gift shop. Get some uh, ACC swag in, a, in the long seat, uh, sleeve variety. And I don't have anything other than short sleeves. Did not expect that. This would normally uh, be about 94 degrees <laughs> this time of year. Devontae Brown, Menchik, Jarrett, bottom third of the order, up for the Wolfpack.
Huff looking at the sign. Those big cards on the wrist that you see for a number of college baseball teams. Bullet to third. Nice job by Malloy. And rifles to first. He had a case of the yips earlier this year, had a nightmare series where he committed a handful of errors, but not here. No, right here, it's a very nice play. Gets his body into position nicely. Kind of takes that back step. That way he's able to get that big hop. Makes it easier for himself. But what I like the most is the way he turned his body to get the proper footwork to make that strong throw to first. One gone for Menchi, who's 0 for 3 today, hitting 247 on the year. If Georgia Tech's going to come back, they're in a good spot in the order to do so in the bottom of the ninth. 2 3 4 do up Gonzalez, Parada, and Malloy. And should anybody reach, then you've got Jenkins and Reed. Again, there's, there's a whole lot of firepower in that lineup. So by no means give up on the Yellow Jackets. That would not be a smart thing to do. Should NC State hold on? Remember, we mentioned they didn't play this season. Well, of course, they didn't play last year in a COVID-shortened season. So those two teams haven't met since 2019. So that'd be kind of a fresh matchup. 2018, I beg your pardon, 2018 is the last time they met. They're in different divisions. So that'd be the first meeting in three years. It's almost hard to believe, but that is the case. It is crazy to believe that that is the case, <laughs> especially with as many games as they played in ACC games that the one time that you were supposed to play the team, you had COVID protocols and you couldn't play those games. Right. It's going to be nice to be able to say no more COVID protocols. Yes. It's just something that was in the past and got left in the past. Amen to that. It's great to see fans back at the ballpark and as good as the contingent is here today I imagine tomorrow you're going to be looking at an even heavier dose of fans particularly if NC State winds up being in the championship game they've won five titles in this event so they'll be looking for number six for that man Elliot Avent. He loves this team. I mentioned the story how they got off to that rough start. He never lost faith in this group. Loves the makeup of this team. The character of this team. And that's going to be a steal again. No chance on that one for Parada. At least Parada did the right thing on that one and that's just to hold on to that ball and not take the throw. And, and yeah, I could see what He's Coach Danny Hall is saying because on, on that swing he went across the plate. But the problem is, is that Parada kind of has to throw it, which you don't want him to throw it. But if he just nuzzles up and bumps him, then you will get the call. So here you see why Danny Hall is so mad. He gets the ball, you see the swing, and he steps across. Now that does stop Parada from being able to throw it. And there it is. Once you step over, he's in oh, yeah. front of the plate. Oh. That should be called interference, right. and he should be out. Danny Hall has a terrific argument there. Now, here's the thing, though. If he bumps him, but what he did was he just stayed behind and held it. Mm -hmm. And since there was no throw, there was no... The umpire is not going to call it. Right, you got to sell it. You got to sell it. You got to be a little actor too sometimes. Runner goes for third, and the throw gets away. Georgia Tech defensively has struggled all year. They were playing a really clean game for much of the day, but it's gone sour in the last couple of innings. Yeah, and this is just Parada trying to do a little bit too much. And Menchik, boy, just unbelievable the way that he's able to, one, get the jumps that he was getting, but then act like nothing's going. I'm going to go ahead and take off again to third. A good throw might get him, but you can't say that it would. 
Ball gets away from Parada and Malloy over there at third and just add on attack on a run, which is huge for NC State. What a valuable run that is. Takes the grand slam out of play. A five run lead instead of four. And now Jarrett gets hit. Danny Hall has seen enough. So we say goodbye to Mr. Huff and hello to a new yellow jacket hurler when we come back. The beautiful sights of Truist Field here in Uptown Charlotte. What a great job this city has done in this area in the shadows of Bank of America Stadium. The newest triple A ballpark built in 2014 and one of the finest triple A yards you will find in the first time Charlotte has ever hosted the ACC championship now in its 47th year. Joseph Manley in his 17th appearance on the bump for G Tech. Yeah, and Coach Danny Hall says, you know what? I'm done with you guys stealing bases. I'm going to bring in my lefty that has a really good pickoff move. 28 strikeouts, 16 walks, and 27 in a third inning. He's got a really good fastball with high spin rate. He's got a good breaking ball to get some swings and misses. But I think this is more about controlling the run game than it is anything else. Trying to keep a guy off of scoring position. Leadoff man Austin Murr is 0 for 4. Again, the Yellow Jackets will have 2 3 4 do up Gonzalez, Parada, and Malloy in the bottom of the ninth. It's going to be a tall task, but if a team can do it, it would be these Yellow Jackets. They've done it already three times in the past 10. They just finished doing it again in this ACC tournament. Well, I mean, you think about, and, and this is where the frustration boils over if you're a head coach. In the case of Danny Hall, you can see the, the anguish on his face. The, the four to one, you, you get that. Like NC State earned it. But then in the eighth inning, a one out walk to Butler and then the key balk. So that leads to one run. And then here, you know, you just get a little bit sloppy. You hope for an interference. Batter's interference call. It doesn't happen. So you give up another run. And th so these last two runs, those are the ones you're like, ah, if we could have just kept this four to one, that is more than manageable with our offense. Well, you look at this inning alone and Menchik, he gets on on a walk. And steals second, steals third, and in a couple pitches he's home, and it's all just by using his legs, and and that's something that Danny Hall is going to look back at and say, hey, if we don't have a play, we can't try to just make something happen. You, we got to be smart with the baseball, and it's something that you're going to be able to use if they're not able to come back in this game for the NCAA tournament. By the way, Gonzalez, Parada, Malloy, a combined one for eight in this game thus far. Over the plate, but high. Speaking of facial hair, as we look at another stash, I know one thing. I know who's not shaving tonight. 
<laughs> you know where I'm going with this. Oh, I know where you're going with it. Duke head coach Chris Pollard. He hadn't shaved since they started that win streak. And Duke has won 11 in a row. So Pollard, he says, look, I know it's not a great look. I know it's kind of a scraggly beard, but hey, I'm not shaving. <laughs> We're winning 11 in a row. I'm not getting that razor out until we lose. And Duke will hope that their head coach winds up looking like Grizzly Adams by the time they leave Charlotte. As they'll take on the winner of this game tomorrow. We'll be with you at noon ESPN 2. I will say earlier this year, there wasn't as much gray yeah. in, in Coach Pollard's beard as there is now. He's got that white beard going, that Coach. distinguished beard. Very distinguished. <laughs> I'm white. There's a strike to McDonough. But hey, if it's if you're winning ball games, you're not cutting anything. You got you're superstitious. If you're a baseball player, you've got some superstitions going on. And shaving when the team is winning, mm -hmm. that's a no-no. You don't do it. So you're saying you you had a couple of winning streak beards in your time? Had some playoff beards, absolutely. Yeah. I grow mine pretty quick, so I didn't matter. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there we go. There's a man on a winning streak. He's he's done the same thing. He hasn't shaved in a couple days only. You know, beard grows quick on him. That's an impressive beard. That is. That's My good stuff. goodness. Plus plus. Oh, too low in it. I think the if it winds up being Duke, NC State. I mean, there's you know obvious storylines there with Tobacco Road and a long time rivalry with with those two programs. But they're they're contrasting in terms of the history. I mean, NC State's been good for quite some time now under Elliot Avent, and as we alluded to in the last game, what Chris Pollard has done. No, no, no. In a short amount of time over the last few years, he's completely turned around a Duke program that was dormant and made them a power. So it's kind of a new kid on the block in Duke versus the consistently good over the last few decades Wolfpack program. That's what we'd be looking at tomorrow if this holds up. High fly ball. Towering shot to left field. And gone. No controversy on this one. We just had to wait for it to come down. McDonough with his first hit of the game. And what a shot it was. And what a shot. You're right. He actually hit the cow. This way we knew that it was going to be a home run because it hits off that foul pole but gets a slider coming in keeps his hands inside is able to keep the ball fair and go ahead and hit you hit you a little bit of a cow right there so we know that it's actually a fair ball. Boom. Never has a cow gotten this much air time. <laughs> in the ACC championship and that kind of feels like a dagger if you're Danny Hall and Georgia Tech things just finally have unraveled here in the ninth inning a three spot for NC State and right now the Wolfpack can smell an appearance in the championship game tomorrow. Johnny Butler one for three. On top of everything else for Johnny Butler has had a sensational season and no doubt is enjoying the success of his team and his teammates. 
you got a chance to hit 400, man. I mean, <laughs> that's something you're talking about when you're 85 and you're in the retirement home. You can tell everybody, hey, I hit 400 in a season. Off the end of the bat, still carrying. And that ball went a wow. long ways. But while the side is retired, the Wolfpack play three, and Tyler McDonough unloads. Oh, he unloads. He gets a little slider in on the hand and pulls it and hits his 14th home run of the season and just opens up the lead for NC State. Eight six and zero oh for the Wolfpack. Another airless game for one of the top defensive teams in the country. One four and two for the Yellow Jackets. Last call for Georgia Tech here in the bottom of the ninth. The winner will face Duke tomorrow at noon on ESPN two. NC State, the number three seed. But if there was a Vegas line, and heck, there might be. I don't know. I didn't check, but. <laughs> Most of the people you talk to around the league kind of favored NC State in this event. So it would not be a surprise if they wind up getting there. For the Duke Blue Devils, the number nine seed, that is a surprise. 11 in a row for Duke. So they'll have all the momentum going in, but NC State would be an awfully hot team as well. If they hold on here in the ninth, Evan Justice still on the bump. The junior left-hander will try to lock it up here. Oh my God. Yeah, it's going to be a, a tall task for Georgia Tech to be able to come back from seven. But these are the at-bats that you cannot throw away. These are the ones that help you for the next game, and you don't want to just go out there and just say, okay, we lost, let's just take it in, pack it in, we're done, let's go. You want to put in some good ABs. You want to be able to stay hot. You don't want to just start chasing. You don't want to try to do too much and try to hit the home run now. Hit hard. Got out the left fielder, Butler. So Gonzalez is retired for the first out. Here in the bottom of the ninth inning, again for Georgia Tech, better days ahead. They should be in great shape for another NCAA tournament. Right now projected as a number two seed. See the metrics on the Yellow Jackets overall. A two seed, of course, in all likelihood would mean Georgia Tech would be on the road, and they'll try to get rid of that nasty streak of 15 years without winning a regional. And for those new to the format, it's the same format we've had since 99. You win a regional, you go to the Supers. That's best two out of three against one opponent. Nice job by Torres. He makes it look easy, doesn't he? He does make it look easy. Ball kind of ate him up just a little bit, though, when he gets up and he saw, oh, boy, you know what? Parada's getting down that line a lot faster than I thought he was going to get and makes a hard throw. Barada's thinking that he is safe at first. <laughs> They're not overturning that. I I, listen, Ty doesn't go to the runner. Thank and that's you for not, saying that. That, that the, is not the rule. It's not in the rule book. People it say is, it all the time. It's never been in the rule book, and it's not in the rule book it, now. It, it is not, and if, if it's a tie and they call an out, it's an out. The only way that that can get overturned, if it's shown that he actually beat it before the ball hits the back of the glove, and I don't think he does, I, I don't see how this is going to get overturned. Yeah, I'd be surprised as well. And again, bang, bang plays on the bases rarely do.
<laughs> I mean, it's, that's, that's, as, that's as bang bang as you're going to see. Well, we weren't, if nothing else, we weren't something about Kevin Parada not having stereotypical catcher speed. Because no. I didn't think it was going to even be that close. Uh, no, and to tell you the truth, I don't think Torres thought it was going to be that mm -hmm. close. When he grabbed that ball, he looked up and all of a sudden went, oh boy, I need to go ahead and rush on this one and throws it across the first. And it's just impressive when you see in an eight to one ball game, a guy getting down the line on a routine ground ball. There's the confirmation. And we are one out away from conclusion here in Charlotte for the second semifinal game. the final hope for the Yellow Jackets. 0 for 3 today. Hammers one to right. Brown is there. Lunges and makes the catch. And North Carolina State is going back to the ACC championship game. 8 to 1 your final. And we'll have a Tobacco Road matchup tomorrow. The Wolfpack, the Blue Devils. First time those two teams will meet since 2018. Duke, Duke defeats Virginia 4-2. And NC State over Georgia Tech 8-1. Blue Devils and Wolfpack tomorrow at noon on ESPN2 will be a whole lot of fun. We hope you'll join us then. Sam Highfill, not to be overshadowed by the offense for the Wolfpack. He set the tone on the mound. Oh, he definitely did set the tone, and he was just absolutely filthy today. Being able to throw that ball where he wanted, whenever he wanted to, outside, inside, up high sliders. He was just absolutely filthy. He was coming three quarters every once in a while just to throw that slider, just to change the eye level of some of the hitters. And boy, he was filthy. And we'll have a chance here in a moment to chat with the young man. Out of Apex, North Carolina, Sam Highfill. And Sam Highfill improving to six and two on the year. By the way, Evan Justice picking up the save for the Wolfpack as we go down to the field now and chat with the hero on the mound today, the freshman Sam Highfield. Obvious question to start things off, Sam. Where does this rank in your young career? I mean, you, you're still just a freshman, but this has to be right up there as one of the best moments of your college career. Yeah, yeah, it's pretty cool. Um, it's easy to pitch in front of these guys. They play hard, and they're really good, and I enjoy it every time. So what was the thought process when Coach Avon said, hey, I'm going to give you the mound for the semifinal game. I need you to go out there and give me some innings. Uh, just be myself, really. Um, and make pitches and for the most part I was able to do that tonight and it was a lot of fun. So it looks like you're getting hassled by your teammates yeah. down there. That's always a good thing when you're yeah. getting hard times by your teammates. That means you did something good. What do you take out of today's game? Uh, a lot of good things. It, it shows how good of a team we are because Georgia Tech's really good. They got a lot of good hitters. They hit a lot of balls hard today, and uh, we're still able to come out on top. So. Sam, you're from Apex, North Carolina. You are no stranger to the rivalry that is the Wolfpack and the Blue Devils. You grew up with it. How special is it to face your longtime rival, and one of which from Tobacco Road, and, and that matchup tomorrow? Uh, it's, it's pretty cool, and they're a really good baseball team. And, yeah, it means a little bit more to me now because uh, my brother actually graduated from Duke uh, about a week ago. So 
<laughs> That's see great. We, see if we can beat them. <laughs> I like the intel on that. Well, somebody in the family will have some bragging rights after tomorrow. You've got the bragging rights for right now. Sam Highfield, terrific performance. Go celebrate with your teammates. All right. Thank you, guys. You got it. Sam Highfield, a promising young freshman. Not the last time we're going to hear his name, and certainly not the last time we're going to see NC State. They'll be back at it tomorrow against the Duke Blue Devils. We will be there with you. High noon ESPN2 for Gabby Sanchez and our entire ACC Network crew. This is Mike Morgan saying so long from Charlotte for now. We'll see you tomorrow at noon. up folks welcome into all ACC that's Kelsey Riggs I'm Dallin Cuff Kelsey we got a great show we, championships continue to be doled out and matches continue to be made we've got the men's national championship in lacrosse field we know what that is we'll preview that show you highlights of that baseball the ACC championship women's lacrosse we're previewing that we're loaded you're off and running. It's exciting because not everybody gets to talk about so many different championships yeah. right now. We've got a lot of teams still in the mix for some of them. Let's show you what happened with the ACC Baseball Championship semifinals, though, to set up the championship game. Number two, uh, number three seed, rather, NC State taking on Georgia Tech. They are the two seed. Scoreless top of the second inning, NC State Bases loaded, two outs. How about JT Jarrett? Bases clearing double to left field, and the Wolfpack take a three to nothing lead, getting it done early. We knew offense would come into play, but just how much offense would we get? Some controversy in the bottom of the sixth inning. NC State up 4 1. Georgia Tech's Kevin Parada hits what looks like Dallin. It's a home run. Yeah. Is it a two run shot to left field? They're trotting around, but NC State coach Elliot Avitt shakes his head. He says, uh-uh, take another look at it. They do. It's called a foul ball. Huge blow for the Yellow Jackets. That would have made it a 4-3 game. Those runs come back. Instead, they only have one, and NC State wins it um, in this one. They've won nine out of their last 11 games, and now they are headed back to the ACC championship looking to win their fifth ACC title their first Dallin since 1992 don't at me Wolfpack fans that's the last championship you've had in baseball men's basketball or football you're the only power five team without a title in this century in those three sports so those guys got to deliver. I so would think. what are we going to see tomorrow here to help us figure it all out is Miami's very own Danny Graves. Danny, talking to you before the game, you talked a lot about what the score could be, just the potential that both of these teams have to get the bats going. And it was NC State that was able to do it. What did you like about what you saw offensively? <laughs> well, exactly what I thought. It was going to be a low scoring game, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they, I think... <laughs> They fooled everybody. The pitchers came out to pitch today or the hitters just couldn't hit. And, you know, uh, how, what is his name? High, high Phil. High he, Phil yeah. he pitched great today. Uh, I mean, this guy was outstanding with everything that he was throwing up there uh, as a freshman. He's flipping balls from the side. He's throwing all different arm angles. Uh, and he ends up going six and a third innings and, and gives up one run. But on the other side, Marquise Grissom Jr., he wasn't pitching poorly until he, he walked a couple guys – he was one pitch away from getting out of that second inning with no runs, and then we could have had a completely different ball game. But then he came out because I think he uh, injured his calf, possibly. But the, the pitching surprised me. The bullpens for both teams surprised me. Um, I, I just thought this was going to be a higher-scoring game, a lot more offense. I know the score is 8-1, to one, but I think the last few runs for NC State were kind of just, you know, like in uh, – Football, they have garbage touchdowns. These were garbage <laughs> runs, uh, in my opinion. It was, it was definitely a better ball game than 8-1. to one. Yeah, no fantasy football or fantasy baseball here. Uh, the garbage runs actually count for other people <laughs> that were excited about it. But uh, let's get to see who NC State's going to be playing in this championship game. Number 9 seed Duke was taking on number 8 seed UVA in the semifinals. And this thing got going right away at Truist Field. First at bat, Joey Loperfredo. Loperfredo. Loperfito. Third time's a charm. Bam! Exactly. Oppo, solo job, leadoff homer, feeling like Ricky Henderson coming through. Get off me! 
Duke up 1 0. More from Lo Perfido. Second time's the charm, too, Dallin. Boom! Let's Check go out again. <laughs> 2 0. They're up. Now we're going to go back to back, Jack. This is all, we're getting all the, the cliches out of the way. Lead off Homer, back to back, Jack. There we go. Ethan Murray. He'll go to center, deep. Did not stay in the yard. 3 0. Duke's in control. They've won 10 straight coming into this game. They are feeling themselves, and they're going to keep doing that. Bottom four, two outs. Duke's up 3 1. Logan Michaels hits a grounder. Chris Crabtree can't handle it. One score, one run comes in on the bad throw. They would take control of that game. Oh, no, I'm sorry. Sorry, Virginia cuts it to 3-2 there. All right, top fifth, two outs. Duke leads 3-2 runners on second and third, and Eric Erickson Nichols hits a grounder. And unfortunately, Nick Kent is going to want that one back. One runner scores. Now it's 4-2. And bottom six, one out, freshman Luke Fox. He pitched a gem, Kel. Seven innings pitched, seven Ks, longest outing in his career. And he was dominant from start to finish. They win, 4-2. Next up, NC State. Let's get to Roddy Jones and Coach Chris Pollard. Coach, 11 straight wins for your team. What is it about this team that has had them catch fire at the right time? So we've had a, an expression, a saying in our program all year. We talk about staying in the fight. And it's no secret, we didn't play very well at chunks during the season. And, you know, a lot of people at the midway point of April kind of had us written off <laughs> to not even be here at this event. Uh, but our kids stayed in the fight, and we kept talking about if we'll just keep everybody within striking distance that we can go on a run late. And, uh, and we've done that, and I'm really proud of our guys. Your team going into tomorrow has been playing as well as anybody in the conference, anybody in the country. Thank you. What would it mean to get a win tomorrow? Well, you know, it, it would be a special thing to bring a championship back to Durham, um, especially with Dr. White retiring this year. Uh, I, I, I would, it, what he's done for me and my family, it would mean so much to be able to bring a, an ACC championship back to Duke. Um, and I, I told our guys, I said, look, after Wednesday's win, you know, we, we felt like we had secured our position in the NCAA tournament. I said, it stopped being about building a resume for the postseason. This is about winning a championship. and. Uh, for these seniors that came back because of COVID, uh, man, it would be a thrill to uh, to watch them dogpile on the field tomorrow. It absolutely would. Well, Coach, congratulations on the win. Thank Good you. luck tomorrow. Thanks. Dallin Kelsey, back to you guys. Thank you, Roddy. Back in here with Danny Graves. Uh, Joey Loperfito was outstanding, 4 for 5 in this game. I believe you tweeted he's the best hitter in the world <laughs> today. Was that hyperbolic or was that, is that fact? What do you think? I, well, yeah, the best hitter on the planet. planet. Today he was, anyways, because n nobody could get him out. Some, somehow he was four for five. I mean, that, that one at bat that he didn't get a hit was uh, a miracle because everything that he was swinging at was hit hard. Whether it was opposite field, he was pulling the ball a little bit. Uh, and of course, he plays a great center field. He's got nice big league hair. I mean, just everything about Joey Loprofido is amazing today and probably going to be again tomorrow. So, Will he be the best hitter on the planet in the future? Probably not, but run with it now. Be the best hitter on the planet right now because this guy is on fire. Yeah, he's been outstanding, uh, as is the team now. 11 straight for the Blue Devils. Uh, they will take UVA on in the championship game uh, tomorrow. ESPN 2, noon Eastern, will start that game. You take a look at the 9 seed versus the 3 seed. NC State, though, 9-2 and two in their last 11. I believe 26-7 and seven now over the last 33. I mean, these are, the, are these the two... Are these the two teams you would want to see at this point, given their form right now, Danny? Yes. And, you know, coming into it, maybe they weren't the two best teams on paper. But at the time when this uh, the ACC championship started, NC State w was the hottest team in baseball. Everybody was talking about how great they were, how they were killing everybody on the road, great defense. And nobody said anything about Duke, myself included. I, they just quietly were winning games. And now... Both these teams, you get them in the, in the championship game, they're the two hottest teams, not only in the conference, but probably in the country, uh, in any conference, you know? So this is definitely great baseball. This is what real baseball people want to see, the two best teams fighting for the championship. High praise for both of these teams from Danny Graves. We will see who comes out a champion tomorrow. Danny, thanks so much.